Members of the House Rules Committee met to discuss legislation House Resolution 155. This bill would create a congressional question period for the U.S. House of Representatives based on the British House of Commons Prime Minister questions, which C-SPAN airs every Sunday evening. The British question time occurs twice each week. Members of Parliament are allowed open access to the Prime Minister to question him on government policy and related issues. House Resolution 155 would create a similar practice here in Washington. The bill would require members of the President's Cabinet to appear before the House on the first Tuesday of each month to field questions and comments by the membership. Over the next several hours, you will meet the bill's sponsor, six-term Democratic Congressman Sam Gadenson of Connecticut, along with representatives of the academic and think tank communities. We take you now to Capitol Hill for our coverage of Wednesday's proceedings, which were gaveled to order by the committee chairman, Democrat Joseph Mowgli of Massachusetts. Committee on Rules will come to order. There's been a request uh, for filming and audio taping of portions of today's proceedings. Is there any objection? Chair has none. As Mr. Gageson doesn't exist, I don't <laughs> The House Committee on Rules today will hold a hearing on H. Res. 155, legislation to establish on a trial basis a congressional question period for members of the President's Cabinet on the first Tuesday of each month. The bill, sponsored by Congressman Sam Getchison, would follow the model used in the British House of Commons and provide an opportunity for members of the House to publicly question Cabinet members regarding executive policies. At this juncture, I'm not sure how I feel about this bill. I've on occasion watched C-SPAN's coverage of the British proceedings on television. They sometimes seem to get a little out of hand, and I always thought the British were very polite and gentlemanly. <laughs> in any event, the issue today is whether we in the Congress should adopt a similar question and answer period with regard to our cabinet members. As a way to introduce this issue, I want to show the committee a recent, a recent segment which appeared on NBC's Sunday Today show about the British question and answer period. And I mean no disrespect to C-SPAN, but the NBC segment is shorter than what C-SPAN usually televises and is therefore better suited for our purposes today. So if the gentleman would dim the lights and just get a slight segment of this. Technological expertise of the Rules Committee staff. Yeah. There, we there we are. Look at our American political process these days, and what do you see and hear? Negative campaign commercials, personal attacks, tabloid exposés. There must be a presidential campaign on, you say. Well, is there a better way? Many people point to the parliamentary system in Europe, particularly in Britain, as a model of reason, serious debate. And indeed, there is, yes, a lot to be said for the way they do it. For one thing, the election campaigns are short, just a few weeks long. Blessed relief. Still, politics there can be rough every day. And Simon Hoggart, a political columnist and former Washington correspondent for the London Observer, looks at their way and ours. Yeah. 
Charles Solomon. Charles Solomon. Charles Solomon. Charles Solomon. Charles Solomon. Everybody knows that the there English is. gentleman Charles is the Solomon. most polite like and reserved man. creature on the face of the earth. He would never insult another gentleman. The Honourable Member and I, I think, came into this house on the same day. I formed the view then that he was a jerk. I've still got that view. <laughs> he wouldn't dream of offering physical violence to a colleague. He wants to get out of that office, get out in the area, find out what's going on, and do something about the problem. So I'll kick his backside for him. A gentleman would never abandon the charge of telling an untruth. If the Right Honourable Gentleman is saying I am a liar, he had better say so bluntly. If he is not, then he had better stop insinuating it. And he would never, ever interrupt a lady. Not yet. Now. <laughs> well, the House of Commons has been on its feet for months because, as in the United States, there's an election coming up. But there's one big difference. Whereas challengers like Pat Buchanan and Paul Songas were more or less unknown to most Americans until a few months ago, in Britain, the opposition leaders have been TV stars for years. And the main reason is that twice a week, for 15 minutes, Prime Minister John Major has to stand at the dispatch box and face everything the other side can throw at him. And why does he just sit there and do absolutely nothing to combat the recession that his policies have caused? After 22 months, doesn't he yet understand that sitting there and crossing his fingers and closing his eyes will not bring recovery? The right honourable gentleman should not be so cheap over such a problem. Mr Speaker, the right honourable gentleman is a dodger. Some people might say on policy rather than personal matters that the right honourable gentleman is a tax dodger. The whole place is designed for total conflict. You're either on the one side or else you're on the other. The only person who's allowed to sit in the middle is the speaker. There was a suggestion that we should rebuild it like the American Congress, semicircular, and it was stopped by Winston Churchill with the memorable phrase, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. And the way this place is shaped means that some debates can make the average college football game seem like an old folks quilting bee. Sounds like a jungle. If he doesn't sort them out, he'll run in the river outside in a concrete suit. Shut up, you fool. Sir William Carr. What's the order of the honest public expenditure? Yes or no? Dig him now. Sling him out. I think that's enough, really. So has the United States lost some of the cut and thrust still found in the forerunner of the U.S. Congress. U.S. Ambassador to Britain, Ray Sykes. At home, you don't really get that sense of a sort of legislative moment. And the British are very good at, at theater, and uh, the House of Commons is one of, one of the best shows going. It's, it's got that wonderful, charming uh, anarchy of, uh, of a real democracy. And uh, we, curiously, tend to be... Uh, a little more stately in our movement. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. I wouldn't trade it at all. I count my blessings for the fact I don't have to go into that uh, pit that John Major stands in, nose to nose with the opposition, all yelling at each other. He and I have talked about that, incidentally. I think he does very, very well. But I think it's, uh, I think it's, that's for him, not for me. Two of the toughest performers at Prime Minister's Question Time are Norman Tebbit and Austin Mitchell. They keep the feud going on their cable TV show, even while they're being made up. So how do you think George Bush would stand up at, uh, if there was a President's Question Time here at the House of Commons? I think he'd be massacred. I think the weakness of the American system is that it can produce somebody as president who has had no experience in government or even leading his party. Here we find out about people during the time they're growing up through the party. We know whether they're any good by the time they get somewhere near the top of their party. It's got too concentrated on that. It's got too simplified just to that. Uh, and what used to be a genuine debate has just become a series of quick, sharp repost as in a quick, stupid argument. Uh, uh, and when you simplify politics to that extent, you've gone too far. 
So, whether or not it would suit the US, this confrontational style, this political arm wrestling, does have its admirers here. But is there anything which should be off limits to members of parliament? Sometimes I'm asked where I would draw the line. Uh, and I have to say, we well, can't ration freedom of speech. I mean, you've either got it or you haven't got it. It may not always sound like speech, but whatever you call the noise emitted here in the Mother of Parliament, it's most certainly free. For Sunday today, this is Simon Hoggart in London. Hey, Sam, I can't wait. But you're quiet, Simon. The, uh, the sponsor of the bill and the uh, person who will explain why this would be beneficial to the American system will be the Honorable Congressman Sam Gageson. Thanks, Sam. We have, uh, we have some opening statements. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll have an opening statement from Mr. Solomon. Do you have a further statement? No. Okay. <laughs> if, if I might uh, indulge the committee, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier when we and uh, uh, they most certainly are. Uh, I'm a Scotsman, and I'm, <laughs> I'm part of that. Uh, but I, I don't think you can say that for the politicians. But, Sam, for uh, those of us who, who enjoy mixing it up occasionally, uh, uh, that looks like fun. But I, I really don't know what we would accomplish. Mr. Chairman, let me just start off by saying that if Rex Harrison were to open this morning's hearing with a song, he might pose the musical question to all of us, why can't the Congress be more like the Parliament? Uh, and just as is the case with Mr. Harrison's actual hit song from My Fair Lady about men and women, I suspect the simple answer is because we were made differently. We're a different government. In a parliamentary system, the prime minister and his or her cabinet ministers, they are members of the parliament, uh, the legislative body. And under our system of government, the president and the cabinet head up a separate and an independent executive branch. And we pride ourselves on this separation of powers. I've heard you and uh, other members do the same thing. Uh, as the primary check against concentrating too much authority, in one place, and I think we always have to be, you know, concerned about that. The uh, proposal of the gentleman from Connecticut, my good friend, Mr. Gagenson, would not alter this separation of powers in any fundamental respect. It simply mimics the parliamentary system. We just uh, watched on TV by inviting cabinet members to appear before the House periodically to answer questions from uh, members of, uh, of that parliament. Nevertheless, I think this committee has a serious obligation to very carefully examine how this minor alteration, and it is a minor alteration, might affect both relations between the two great branches of, uh, of our government and the internal operations and processes of this House. In anticipation of this hearing, I wrote to, uh, to all of the ranking Republicans of uh, House standing and select committees, of which there are many, many. Uh, for their views on this question period proposal. Uh, of the 11 who responded, only one expressed uh, outright support for it. And another member suggested that if we have a question period on alternating months, we should also call the speaker and also the committee chairman to come before the Congress. And uh, let's have a little bit. I think uh, if we're going to do this, uh, Sam, you might, uh, you might consider that, uh, because I think that's a, a thought worth mulling. The other eight expressed opposition for a variety of reasons, and they included opinions that, uh, and this is why I wanted to make my opening statement, because they couldn't be here uh, to state some of their, their uh, opposition. Uh, for instance, cabinet members already spend an inordinate amount of time on the Hill before committees and subcommittees. And uh, that, I think, is why there was opposition from uh, Democrat uh, chairman as well as ranking Republican members. It would be also more difficult to get them to appear before committees. Uh, committee oversight and legislative responsibilities would consequently be, be undermined. And a question period is really no substitute for the kind of in-depth questioning and information gathering committees can perform. Um, and I think these are some of the things we have to consider as we, as we process through this hearing. 
they go on to say uh, it would harm relations between the branches because of its partisan confrontational nature, which we just saw uh, on television in the British Parliament. And, and uh, you wonder how anything gets accomplished on, under those uh, circumstances, although I don't think it would be as bad uh, in our house, at least I hope not. Uh, and it would make, uh, make it more difficult for the two branches to work out compromises and to effectively govern. And that, that one took me because I guess the thing I had to learn when I first got into uh, politics was to compromise. And that's hard to do because when you do that, you feel like, uh, and Sam, you're a principled guy, and uh, uh, I know that bothers you when you have to compromise because you believe so strongly in your principles. Uh, anyway, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that a staff summary and the full text of those letters be inserted in the hearing record along with a response I received from Secretary of Labor Lynn Martin, who used to be a member of our committee here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, notwithstanding this opposition and my own personal view that a question period would result in, a, in more heat than light, I welcome this opportunity to explore the proposal further. Uh, I'm sure our distinguished uh, roster of witnesses on both sides of the issue will give us uh, some insights. Uh, I especially want to commend Sam Gagenson for introducing the measure and forcing us to think more about how we might improve this institution. Uh, its oversight of the executive and full and open dialogue on national policy questions, which are sometime missing uh, before this Congress. I happen to believe this institution is in need of real comprehensive reform and that the place to start is with our committee system and not on the House floor. To the extent any innovation might be weakened, might weaken our, rather than strengthen our committee system and its deliberative process, it should be rejected. After all, our principal function under the Constitution is to be a legislative body, not a debating society. Our committees are at the very heart of the legislative process, and as a legislative body, we will ultimately be judged by the strength of that heart and how well it enables this body to formulate legislative solutions to our nation's problems. I especially hope members of this committee, that this committee will exercise its original jurisdiction authority, which you have done, Mr. Chairman, since you took over as chairman of this committee, and consider resolutions by Representatives Hamilton and Gratison and myself to form a joint committee on congressional reform. My particular one uh, would uh, form a House Commission on Legislative Process Reform. This is so badly needed in this Congress. Obviously, this committee could undertake the reform task itself if we somehow found the time to do it. And you know, we are a 12-month body now. We're not here for three or four months. I think we have the time. But the important thing is not so much as who undertakes this task as it is that we begin now to lay the groundwork for both a, a rational and a comprehensive reform of this House. If we do not begin to move now, we may be overtaken by a reform form fervor of some kind in the next session that could lead to what I would consider ill-conceived or hasty changes that might harm rather than help this institution. So again, let me just uh, commend the gentleman for coming before us, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing what the witnesses have to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Thank for you, bearing Mr. with me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gaines, I think you have an excellent idea, and I commend you for, for bringing it uh, this far and bringing it before the committee, and I hope that uh, we'll vote uh, on it, and I hope uh, favorably, and I hope one of these days we'll be able to do it. You know, I think it was Bill Fulbright back in the late 40s that uh, suggested that uh, he went much further than your proposal, of course, but I think because of his proposal, as I recall, the then President Harry Truman referred to him as an overeducated SOB. Uh, but, well, I don't think you, I, I, don't, I don't think you run any danger of anyone saying it either, having known you for a long time. <laughs> You're a great man, just the same. But, you know, uh, one of the problems uh, uh, that, that our constituency and, and, and the people in this country, I think, uh, and one of the major problems have with our government is a lack of accountability. You know, uh, uh, if something goes wrong, uh, blame the president, the president blames the Congress. You blame the Congress, the Congress blames the, uh, the administration or blames the president. And uh, if you can't think of anything else, then they blame the bureaucrats. Uh, so uh, if you can't do that, we blame the Japanese, and it goes, uh, it goes on and on. But uh, as far as our government is concerned, we do need more accountability. And I see this, uh, this proposal of yours as something that, that, will, that will give us uh, uh, more accountability. My goodness, 
I think it would be, a, you know, I think it would be a wonderful opportunity, and I, I think it would benefit the administration, and I think it would benefit the Congress, and I think as a result the, the country would benefit to hear. You know, we get so removed. I mean, we're, we're talking to each other through, through the press and through the television, and uh, it, it just seems to me that it would be a marvelous thing to have uh, members of the administration to answer questions from the Congress and, and vice versa. And, and I, I just have to believe that the legislative process and the process of, of government uh, it uh, would, would flow on, on, a, on a much more even keel, and, and we'd all be better for it. So I, uh, I do uh, commend you, and, and I look forward to supporting you, and, uh, and look forward to, uh, to, to that day when it comes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Derrick. Mr. Dryer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, congratulate you, Sam, for bringing it this far. I have to say, uh, in response to my, my good friend from South Carolina, I kind of scratched my head as I look at Neil Kinnock and John Major going at it to, to, by any stretch of the imagination, believe that that has brought an end to blame. All they did was sit there and point the fingers at each other, screaming and yelling and ranting and raving. And it seems to me that in this nation we do have this separation of powers and with the advent of C-SPAN the American people are able to see uh, administration officials come before Congress on a regular basis. And uh, this question of accountability, which you raised, Butler, I think is uh, is not terribly warranted here. We have a constant reporting from members of the executive branch. And uh, as we look at uh, the uh, difference in our governments, I think that they should be recognized. And I mean, it would create high theater. But frankly, the debate that the American people have watched in the Congress over the past few weeks, just the debate last week on the, the check bouncing scandal and other things, we are doing a marvelous job of creating high theater for the American people the way things stand today. And uh, I've seen debates almost as colorful as that as we saw in the House of Commons just a few minutes ago. So I think that it's a fascinating idea and it's one which we should consider, but I hope that we'll do it in a very, very cautious way. I know that this proposal came up uh, uh, in the Carter administration and uh, this was something that, that was considered then. When both the executive branch and the legislative branch were in the same party and uh, I wonder why it wasn't pursued uh, at that time. But I think that as we uh, look at this challenge here, I think some would like to simply have another opportunity to bash George Bush over the head. And uh, I, I mean, I, I know that to be the case just based on the statements that I've heard from some people. Uh, frankly, as he said, he gets beat over the head pretty well by us. Uh, often we do it to, to his face. And uh, I think that uh, as we uh, move ahead with this, it'll be an interesting debate to see whether or not we proceed with it. And I uh, uh, look forward to the deliberations here. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hadn't intended to speak and therefore I'm sure you are urging me to not do so but <clears throat> because of the uh, I've been inspired by some of the comments the other members have made and I must say also by the by those five minutes or so that we just saw on on, um, on the television set there which uh, and I must admit the same as my, my friend from California Dave Dreyer uh, I was turned off by that I saw a lot of <clears throat> cheap shots so a lot of confrontation. Frankly, I think we've had far too much of that in our government. I think we need more thoughtful debate. I don't think we need the kind of, of yelling at each other that we saw there. Uh, I think that uh, the political process has already been damaged enough in, in this country, and frankly, I just think that uh, that would add to it. What we've got to do in this country, it seems to me, I've been telling people back home, is to get away from, from if, if you care about accountability, which, which our good friend Mr. Derrick from South Carolina, some of whose comments I also found myself agreeing with, even though he seems to be coming out on, on the other side. But if you care about accountability, which is exactly what we need in this country, uh, I've been suggesting to people back home that it's their fault, basically, not, not ours. But um, our problem is divided government. We've had for 12 years, more or less, uh, 12, 13, 12 years, a Republican president, and most of that time, a Democratic-controlled Congress. So back, people back home don't know who to blame. They blame everybody. They blame the, Democratic, the Democrats in Congress. They blame the Republicans. Who are, who are presidents, and in a sense they're right. Everybody right, is right back home. But the truth of the matter is, as members here know, is that we can't do anything. I mean, we're stuck. Uh, we pass some bills, the, the majority of Democrats, the president vetoes them. We don't have one party pulling together and trying to solve the problems of this country. What we might need is not, it's not so much a question period, Sam, but a parliamentary form of government. 
Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really suggesting it, but what we really have to do, what I'm suggesting to people back home is that this year, they, th this year the, 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 the people back home, for example, as and this is true in many districts, voted overwhelmingly for my district for Ronald Reagan and for me. Makes no sense. We didn't agree about anything in the world. They did it for a reason, obviously. They liked him. They felt comfortable with him. At the same time, they sent a lot of Democrats to Congress to make sure that Mr. Reagan didn't fulfill all of his promises, because even though they liked him, they really didn't, really didn't want him to. Right. In, in all seriousness. And I suggested to people back home that this year they, they vote for a Republican for, they either vote for a Republican for President and a Republican for Congress or a Democrat for President and a Democrat for, pre, for, for Congress. And make one party for four years responsible, give them, you know, give them the power to run the country. If they do a bad job, throw them out and elect the other party four years from now. That's, that I think is what we've got to come to. And I really don't think, frankly, with the with the nonsense, if I may say so, that we've been seeing ourselves put through the last few days, the last few weeks because of our current problems, and we've seen it before and we're going to see it again. The last thing we need is more of this sniping at each other and yelling at each other in, in the, in the non-thoughtful, non-helpful ways that we've just seen on that television screen. So I must say that um, even though in theory it's a nice idea, I also want to say, my friend, Jerry Solomon, that I like the idea, frankly, of having an opportunity of, of, of questioning the speaker and the committee chairman. So at least we can work on the responsibility of, 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 of running our own house here responsibly. We never have a chance of asking committee chairman why you've been sitting on that bill for a, a year and a half now, and we can't get it on the floor, even though the, the, the public is demanding it. You know, so on top of which, bringing cabinet members is a lot different from bringing prime minister. Cabinet members have, in most instances, very little power in this country. If you're going to bring the president, that's one thing. But he's, I mean, we have a divided form of government here, and it doesn't make sense, it seems to me, if you don't have a parliamentary government. But aside from those thoughts, I don't have many others. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, for a fellow who wasn't prepared to speak, you really, <laughs> well, the more you really listen, made your point. Whatever it was. I'm Mr. Frost of Texas. Uh, Sam, this, this, please take this as a serious question, because it is one, um, even though you may be tempted not to respond seriously. Um, we see in the paper this morning that three uh, members of the President's cabinet bounced checks. Now, would that be fair game in a question period if Mr. Cheney were up here and Mr. Madigan and Lynn Martin were before us in a question period? Would we be able to go into matters like that? I want a serious answer, yes. Well, I think that, um, that you would be able to present any question that you have to the uh, member of the cabinet in writing in advance. And I think that in any form of democracy, to try to restrict that becomes arbitrary. I think the goal, of course, would be uh, to deal primarily with the substantive areas that the individual is responsible for. Uh, and I think that, uh, if I may at this point, to say that I think our system would work different than the, than the British system, uh, in that most of our debate operates under a different kind of decorum uh, than the British system. The British debate is much more lively uh, both in question period and in the normal uh, debate of a bill on the floor. So if I wanted to ask Secretary Cheney about why he wasn't releasing the money for the V-22 made in Texas, I could, I could ask that. But if some other member wanted to ask Secretary Cheney why he bounced checks, some other, some other member could do that also. I would think it would be very difficult to censor members. I certainly wouldn't be for it. It would be up to the leadership in our proposal uh, to choose the members that speak and recognize uh, the Republican leader would pick Republicans, the Democratic leader would pick uh, Democrats. Okay, I have no other questions. Uh, um, you may have come in a little late, Monty. This, this, is, this segment is just for opening statements for members. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, I, this is the first time I've sat in on a hearing like this, and uh, it's probably the first time in years this idea has come before Congress. I, on the surface, I like the idea. The fact is, is that so many of our bureaucracies or people that have been in the bureaucracy for years are so arrogant, and you never have a chance to get at them. You never have a chance to ask questions, and they are, are insulated because they don't have to stand before the people and get elected. They make decisions uh, well, that uh, oftentimes affect hundreds of thousands of people. I'm having a problem right now with the Department of Energy. I believe there's tremendous arrogance there in the way they make decisions in a very callous, cavalier attitude. I'd like to be able to question them publicly, put their feet to the fire about some things that are happening. And it's, it's very difficult to do that. I think that this kind of forum that you're talking about would be very useful to the government and to the people of this country. 
Yes. Just for one quick uh, this, point on that. These are just opening statements. Just. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a very brief opening statement. I applaud and congratulate Mr. Gadenson for his idea and for introducing this legislation. Uh, most people in this country somehow have the idea that the impression that the Congress has a healthy and ongoing dialogue uh, with the members of the cabinet. And one of the things you first learn when you, when you get here is that you don't. Unless you serve on a committee of jurisdiction that occasionally has a cabinet member agree to come in, you never get the opportunity to talk to a member of the cabinet, hear their ideas, discuss with them the direction that the country or their department is headed in. I think this uh, would provide a, a, an opportunity for a healthy discussion with the cabinet members. Uh, I think there might be some details that need to be worked out on it, but it's certainly an idea that we should explore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me first say that uh, I want to I want to commend and thank the chairman uh, for giving me this opportunity to present this idea to the committee, and that um, that there's clearly a need in this country uh, to focus the debate. Uh, I think that uh, while there is a lot of debate that goes on, and we can thank uh, uh, CNN and C-SPAN and C-SPAN <coughs> two and the news channels that what we have at times is almost clutter. And to argue that, uh, that, that 100,000 people in a stadium, each speaking simultaneously, uh, is somehow clear debate, is to argue that we in our system are able to clearly debate the issues of the day uh, with the administration. Uh, it seems to me that, um, uh, that, that this is an opportunity uh, for both the executive and the legislative branch uh, to improve not just its image, uh, but its efforts before the American people. And uh, presently, committee chairmen uh, have a very difficult time often getting cabinet members to come before their committees in a timely manner. Uh, lower level staffers uh, and uh, appointees are sent uh, who really don't have the information and can't put that uh, statement uh, before the committee or answer uh, the committee's questions. Uh, the Congress in its first uh, years had cabinet secretaries before it on 22 different occasions. And on 22 different occasions, uh, the separation of power didn't crumble even in the earliest uh, days of uh, this great democracy. And I believe that separation of power uh, would not be injured by bringing cabinet secretaries uh, to the floor of the House uh, for a debate today. I don't think we would duplicate the British system. Frankly, uh, sometimes we are the stuffier ones, uh, although our stereotypes of the British would have us think that uh, they are. Uh, but uh, what we need in this country is to be able to have the American people uh, see the administration, Democrat or Republican, and see the Congress in its divided form uh, debate the major issues of the day. Healthcare shouldn't be a series of press statements from the Democrats and a series of press statements from the Republicans. Secretary Sullivan shouldn't make his utterances in isolation of the Congress in a sense, and the Congress shouldn't make theirs in isolation. A direct contact to the two would give the American people a better understanding of what the choices are, and I believe that debate would lead to better policy in this country. President Carter did request come before the Congress and have an opportunity to go through a question period, and I think Speaker O'Neill, frankly, made the wrong decision in denying him that opportunity. And there aren't many things uh, that I disagree with uh, Speaker O'Neill on. Uh, what we have here is an opportunity with the modern telecommunications to give the American people a clear and a focused understanding of where the Congress is and where the administration is. Now, I'd like to play some uh, letters in the record if, uh, without objection, if the committee's approval we have one uh, from Margaret Thatcher, uh, one from uh, Jack Kemp, uh, one from uh, Ed Drewinsky, and uh, one from Richard Darman, all who express uh, varying degrees of support for the idea. Some, of course, say that they'll do it if the president allows them to do it. That's quite understandable for cabinet people. The way I understand the early, forma the early formation of the Congress, the Committee of the Whole, frankly, was a committee. <coughs> It was a committee that did legislative hearings and did legislative business because we only had about three committees. We had, I believe, appropriations, finance, and veterans, maybe one or two others in the early days. And whether we use that format or some other, uh, it seems to me that it's not an ambush of the, uh, of the president, as I think some Republicans see it, because clearly 
the party in power gets a majority in a sense of the time because the minority gets half the time and the cabinet member gets a portion of the time to answer so that if you've got a situation as we have today the president's party really gets probably close to two-thirds of the time in getting their message across what I would do is simple uh, I would choose the first Tuesday of the month uh, for two hours uh, the speaker after uh, consultation with other uh, members of Congress uh, leadership uh, would uh, invite a cabinet secretary uh, the questions would have to be submitted to the cabinet secretary uh, seven days in advance because uh, what we're not looking is to surprise him with that trick question how many employees do you have in you know the embassy in a certain country uh, or what have you what we're really trying to do is get policy understanding and we want them to have these questions in advance people would be allowed a follow-up question uh, it would be my opinion uh, that the questioning should start with the chairman of the full committee of appropriate ju jurisdiction followed by the subcommittee chairman as well as the ranking individuals uh, on the other side uh, the questioning would alternate from uh, republicans uh, to democrat with uh, uh, follow-up questions allowed uh, no committee business should be allowed uh, during those two hours of the month so the congress as a whole uh, would participate in this uh, uh, opportunity for a discussion and uh, if members are weary of it uh, then what I would suggest is try it on a, a trial basis uh, do it for a year uh, to see how it develops don't make it a permanent uh, part of the rules uh, but what we have today is and I, I want to cut this short so I can answer questions is that we have more heat than light because at the same time the Secretary of State is testifying on the House side, the Secretary of Defense is on the Senate side, the Secretary of Health, Education, or Welfare or someplace else, and there's so much going on that it's difficult to get a focus on an issue of national importance. And whether it be the war that is about to start with Iraq at some point in history, or health care, or unemployment, or taxes, it seems to me to make sense to have a focused discussion in the well of the House with the administration about the proposed tax bill uh, that will be coming to the floor uh, or other pieces of legislation that affect the good of the nation. Uh, so again, I thank the committee uh, for giving me this time to present this proposal, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Sam, you said one time the cabinet members did present themselves to the Congress for question and answering? Yeah, in the early, uh, the early uh, first uh, sessions of the Congress, and I think, frankly, the fear um, uh, th that um, it, 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 was a very, it was a trying time, obviously, and the, 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 legis the House and the Senate were trying to develop the relationships uh, between themselves. I'm always am uh, amused by the, uh, the early story of the Senate proposed that in communications with the House, the House should send to the Senate an elected leader of the House, either the Speaker or the Majority Leader, to carry the message to the Senate, but that when the Senate would communicate with the House, they would simply send a paid staffer uh, to send their messages to the House. So there clearly was a period of trying to get people's feet on the ground and get established and try to figure out how this great democracy works. It seems to me we are secure uh, in our position in this Congress uh, as an institution. We have frankly lost power as an institution, not by any uh, Supreme Court decisions, although a few have troubled me, uh, but more so by the fact that the, admin the president, no matter who he is, speaks with one voice and the, the number of voices that we have here at the Congress tend to not make for a clear debate. And I think question period would frankly give Congress uh, more of an equal footing with the president, Democrat or Republican, uh, in, in, in that it would place us on the same plane, uh, at least with, with the leading cabinet secretary on a particular issue. And the cabinet member who's invited <coughs> to participate with the Congress would have in advance written questions. Yes. And there'd be no straying from that. Uh, the follow-up questions obviously would give an individual some leeway. Well, they have, they'd have to be germane to the regular I, question. My, my feeling was they should be germane to either the question or the answer that the secretary gave. Right. And again, the purpose here isn't to embarrass the, que the secretary uh, by asking uh, uh, him or her a, a question that they're not prepared for. We want them to be prepared because what we want is the answer. And these are just on policy matters? My focus would be on policy matters. I think that you'd have to give the majority leader and the minority leader of each party the right to choose members and a question submitted uh, that they'd have the opportunity to, to reach almost any range.
I mean, I think it's difficult to say that you're going to start putting, a, as I think Mr. Frost's question indicated, some kind of uh, wall around what the questions could be. And would the communicate to this cabinet person uh, name the person who he would be facing uh, as a questionnaire? Well, in my opinion, there'd be no advantage or no reason uh, to uh, or, or disadvantage to include the name of the individual that sent the question. Again, it might give the cabinet secretary a better understanding of, you know, if, 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 if someone's asking about a particular uh, program that exists in their district, it obviously gives a different focus sometimes. And I think that would be helpful to the uh, cabinet secretary to understand, you know, what the questioner was looking for. When is the last time the Congress has dealt with this? Um, actually, I think there have been a number of times. I think uh, it is, uh, I think uh, Walter Mondale made a proposal. I think Mr. Fulbright made, Senator Fulbright made a proposal. Uh, there was a proposal uh, made um, uh, as early as uh, the Civil War period by a gentleman named Pendleton. And there was another one uh, in, in the 19, uh, in the year about 1913. I think what has changed, and, and, and the reason that this is so important, is that modern communication give the executive branch the ability to articulate a position, if they so desire, uh, that reaches the entire country. And then the response to that is often such a wide variety of responses from House, Senate members, Democrats, and Republicans, that you don't get a real dialogue between the legislative and executive branches. And that by, by doing this in the well of the House, without other legislative business going on at that time, it would give a very direct focus. And, you know, Jerry is concerned for the heat of the debate, uh, making it more difficult to work out compromise. Uh, I would say that uh, the, uh, the gentleman uh, from New York and I have had a number of heated debates, and that it's never interfered with our ability to work uh, on issues that we agreed on or coming to some <coughs> compromise that we felt was for the good of the country. Uh, that the people who serve the president and serve this country, I believe, are people who do believe strongly, sometimes differently, but understand it's their responsibility uh, to do that in a, in a manner that brings respect on this institution. The communication coming from the House to the Cabinet Secretary is an invitation. Is that so? It's not a mandate. Well, it's, you know, the argument of whether or not we can subpoena, you know, the, uh, the, the various Cabinet Secretaries and Would that violate documents. the separate, separation of the powers? I don't think it, I don't think it does. And uh, you've got uh, people who are more expert on these things than I am behind me, Mr. Cutler and others. But I'd say that we, that we regularly subpoena documents uh, of, uh, of Cabinet Secretaries. And I think it's within our power to demand that they come before the Congress and, uh, uh, and uh, provide uh, testimony on issues. This, uh, uh, this uh, committee of the Congress, the committee of the whole, could be given powers in our rules as any other legislative committee of the Congress to hold any kind of hearing uh, that the Constitution allows us to do. And I think calling a Cabinet Secretary is uh, within our powers. Do you feel that this type of uh, uh, program that you uh, bring forward would be any kind of an encroachment on the committee chairman? No, I don't, because I think that the it's not a, it would not be a committee that would initiate legislation. Uh, it would be a, com a committee of debate for the Congress. And, um, and it seems to me that when the committee of the whole uh, takes its actions now, uh, it, does, it has debate. Uh, that debate then has to be ratified in the full House, either in a, in a vote, uh, uh, an oral vote or, or a vote by electronic device. So it seems to me that uh, with that same pattern of activity, uh, the committee of the whole could be the vehicle uh, to call cabinet members to the Congress, that you could have that debate. It would be within uh, the Congress's rights. It would not interfere with a committee jurisdiction on initiating uh, legislation. and. Um, you know, frankly, it's a one-way dialogue at this point. We have the State of the Union. The President shows up. Uh, he has his message that he sends to the American people, and that's the end of the dialogue uh, with the Congress and the administration. I think that uh, we need to expand on that. In the parliamentary systems, isn't it a daily question period? It varies from uh, parliamentary system to parliamentary system. Uh, I think the British have it twice a week. Uh, the Prime Minister isn't always uh, the one that does it. Oftentimes, 
cabinet secretaries in the Canadian system are the ones that take questions. So someday the agricultural minister in Canada might come before the parliament and answer questions about agricultural policy. Would the once a month format be adequate uh, on, on things of great matter to the Congress? Well, I, I think, you know, I'd always be for the maximum flexibility. I think for, for the comfort of the, uh, of the executive and for people concerned that we'd be dragging them down here, you know, every day for something, I think that a structure, at least at the beginning, to see how it works in a text period uh, makes sense. I think, frankly, an administration would find it of some value to come and put its position forward before the American people and the Congress in that context, and I think as it would develop, we would find that both the Congress and the executive uh, would utilize this opportunity for the kind of debate that uh, uh, it would provide. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, I have, I have a uh, series of questions, but I think uh, a lot of them are technical in nature, and if it's all right, maybe I can submit them sure. for the record. I'm sure the, uh, the gentleman will be glad to respond to the committee before we have our final report. Without objection. And we'll save everybody a lot of time. Sam, let me, uh, let me tell you one of my concerns is that uh, C-SPAN, you know, has done a great service, I think, uh, to the American people. And uh, every day there are more and more viewers. And certainly if we were to go to this, <coughs> this, <coughs> this form, as we've seen on the, on the uh, television set a few minutes ago with the British Parliament, I have no doubt in my mind but what C-SPAN's viewing audience would probably triple. They haven't put me up to No, 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 I know that. No, no. That. But, uh, but the reason it would triple is because it would become good entertainment. That's the problem. Good entertainment. And, uh, you know, I have enough trouble with people like uh, one of the uh, so-called Republican candidates running for president. Uh, he is an entertainer. Uh, named Pat Buchanan, you know, he didn't know the first thing about government. He always said politics. nice things about you, and <laughs> said that frankly you shared some of the very same kind well, of Mr. Cutler conservative be, philosophy. Mr. And, Cutler you know, will be coming. I on wouldn't want to defend him here because we obviously differ <laughs> considerably. Mr. Cutler will be coming on in a few minutes, uh, and he and I have had some discussions in the past about uh, about uh, young men who avoid the draft, uh, uh, not being available uh, for for uh, college loans and credits, and I'll discuss that in a few minutes uh, with about my friend Mr. Buchanan. Okay, but uh, let me get back to the subject here. Um, that's what I'm concerned about is that it be, would become entertainment. See, I, have a greater, I have greater respect for the American people. And I well, think that frankly, if members of Congress took this uh -huh. opportunity uh, to simply demagogue or uh, in some way try to embarrass the secretary, it seems to me that they would lose the day and that uh, the leadership of both parties uh, again, I think our system, you know, and I, it, it, it shocked me when I first got a sense of this. Our system has far greater decorum, maybe too much decorum on a regular basis, as compared to the British. And I don't think the American people would sit back and give credit to the, uh, to the party, whether in power or out of power, who abused this system. And frankly, if you think about our hearings and compare them to what you see in question period. Well, we have the same opportunity if our goal is simply to try to embarrass the secretary there without giving the secretary questions in advance. Uh, that I think what you find most of the time is a very honest debate on issues and not simply the cheap shot trying mm -hmm. to get the best mm -hmm. prime time, you know, part of the news. And no, I but, think, again, uh, the let, public let, recognizes uh, that. No. Uh, I've let you uh, go on, but let me, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, what you just said sort of leads to what we might get into. You, you said you have greater respect for the American people, and you know you don't have greater respect for the American people than I do. You may have equal respect, but let's get on to, the, uh, to, to my other concerns. Uh, first of all, I'd like to see the letters uh, from uh, Kemp and Darman and some of the others uh, so that we might have them during the hearing, because I haven't seen those letters, and uh, I'd like to review them. Uh, someone in earlier, I don't know whether it was you, Sam, or, or one of the members on the panel or on the uh, committee here, uh, mentioned that li they like to grill cabinet members. And, uh, you know, uh, we have the right to do that now, all 435 of our members in public. Uh, I see my friend Danny Fassell over there, uh, who uh, I had the privilege of serving on his, his committee for many, many years. And uh, even though I'm not on that committee anymore, 
uh, I can go before the Veterans Affairs Committee, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and uh, those uh, chairmen have uh, great respect for the members, and they will either let us testify uh, before uh, and during their hearings, or they'll let us participate in grilling those cabinet members. So, you know, we still have, um, we, we still have that right. Uh, finally, yeah, you know, I know you're very sincere in what you're, what you're offering here, and, uh, and uh, it's worth mulling. It certainly is. But I, again, uh, Lee Hamilton is one of the most respected members of this House, and Bill Gratison, and uh, he, the, those two, and myself and others have legislation that would uh, set up task forces to really look at our system, not just this question and answer problem. We have such a terrible problem now. We have so many committees and subcommittees and select committees and joint committees, we are committed to death. And members don't even have time to serve on all of these subcommittees. Drugs is such a terrible problem today. And yet, anyone who has drug legislation, and I've sponsored drug legislation for years now uh, on, to, on various issues dealing with drugs, and all of my legislation gets sequentially referred to something like 47 subcommittees. And there's no way that that legislation is ever going to become law. So, you know, uh, I, I respect, just a minute, I respect your coming to the committee and, uh, and uh, pushing this issue uh, because it's worth considering and we ought to, we ought to debate it. Uh, but again, you respected members like you who are interested in reforming the House really ought to get behind uh, Mr. Hamilton and others and let's see if we can't do something about really trying to make this system work and, and be more responsive to the American people that you and I have great respect for. The, um, yes. I think that, um, one, I'm supportive of what Mr. Hamilton is doing, uh, but I'd say that uh, the argument is then the, uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good, that uh, if we sit here and wait for the perfect reform, for the ultimate improvement on the legislative system, then we'll make none of the smaller improvements that will make the process better. And I think this is something that will not greatly disrupt the world. It won't change the balance of power in the Congress, but I think it will to a far better degree give the public an opportunity to understand what the executive stands for, what the minority in the Congress stands for, and what the uh, majority in the Congress stands for. I thank the gentleman for his time. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Mr. Derrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gatins, as I understand, you uh, propose to do this once a month. Well, you know, I've fully endorsed your proposal, but uh, I think you make a mistake. Uh, you know, I think, uh, and, and as I further, as I understand that you would uh, have it uh, kind of controlled by the Committee of Jurisdiction, is that correct? No, I would have the majority leader and the minority leader uh, control the time for each side, as is custom in the House. Uh, I would have the first two questions on each side given to the chairman of jurisdiction and then the subcommittee chairman of jurisdiction out of deference for the work they do in these areas. And then the remainder of the time would be uh, according to the minority leader and, minor and majority leader's uh, uh, decision is how it's distributed. Well, let, let me suggest to you that I think you're making possibly two uh, wrong turns on this thing. To begin with, if you do it once a month, I mean, that's kind of ho-hum. I think you ought to do it uh, more often than that. I think you ought to do it once a week, once uh, or twice a, a month. Another problem is, and, and part of the problem that we all understand about this institution, I guess, at least I think I understand it, is that uh, that you have, uh, over the years, you have uh, somewhat of an incestuous relationship that, uh, that, that comes about between the committees of jurisdiction and those that, uh, that they oversee. And over a period of time, in many instances, rather than becoming disciplinarians of, of that uh, area that they uh, oversee, they become advocates. And uh, I think that if you were going to turn this over to, uh, to the various committee, I think you, you might as well forget about it and just go ahead and let the uh, various uh, committee chairmen appear before the, uh, uh, the committees uh, as they do now. now I, I wouldn't let them monopolize the time, clearly. Uh, I, I just think that uh, a chairman who's done the work in an area ought not be simply discarded in the process. Well, I, I, but, I wouldn't but, but, but I don't think they ought to be discarded, but I still, at the same time, they have their own avenues. Uh, to, uh, I mean, you know, Mr. Uh, Hall is not here right at the moment, but uh, as, as he uh, uh, suggested, that he's having a hard time getting answers out of uh, uh, out of one of the uh, administrative committees. So I, I think you would make a uh, a very uh, 
Well, you, you would make a mistake on that. I think you, that I would suggest that you have them more often and that you not, I, you know, I think another one of the problems is we have things around here in so many instances that are too well structured. I mean, I, I, what I perceived uh, you to want is, is, is a free-for-all, uh, not a, a bloody free-for-all, but a, a certainly a, a sense of getting out there and those people who normally don't have an opportunity to ask questions uh, to, to, to have and, and, and respond. And, and I think if you're, if you're able to do that, would be. let me ask you, do you have any problems with the uh, division of power questions? I know the chairman touched on that. Uh, no, I don't think so, because I think you know, from my perspective, uh, uh, we do bring uh, the cabinet secretaries before the House. The President of the United States comes and gives his State of the Union, uh, and so clearly the presence in the chamber of the executive doesn't violate the separation of powers. Uh, the President comes and speaks to the Congress every year, doesn't seem to trouble him at all. I don't think there's any trouble in bringing in his cabinet secretaries and having a two-way dialogue. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't oppose, uh, if I was king, uh, to have it uh, on a weekly basis or even more often than that. Uh, but I think that um, uh, realistically uh, to try to get bipartisan support, and there seems to be some uh, concern on both sides, but uh, uh, most of the concern on, on our, our friends, the Republicans, that, uh, that somehow this would be uh, too difficult for the cabinet secretaries or too damaging to them if they came before the Congress. Uh, and, and therefore I'm proposing limits on it so that at least we get to try it. A philosopher king, not just a king. Yes, no, of course. We wouldn't want to be kind of thoughtless. Uh, 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 yes, no. philosopher. <laughs> well. Uh, and, and the, uh, uh, do you, maybe, maybe this has been covered, but do you, would you anticipate the President of the United States uh, uh, coming down here and, and being subject to, to questions? Uh, not in this proposal. Uh, I personally wouldn't be uh, against inviting the President uh, before the Congress and having him in this kind of exchange. And I think again that President uh, Carter uh, made what was a good offer and I wish Tip had accepted it. Uh, but I think frankly if we try to do that uh, then uh, people like my good friend Mr. Solomon uh, would find it too threatening of the President's uh, position politically uh, possibly and then we would have uh, too much of a partisan battle. Well, I think what Mr. Solomon would like would maybe to have also included in that form of presidents uh, to come so we could have President Reagan to come back in uh, and, and, and address <laughs> the body as well, which would suit me fine. He's very, very fine, a very fine man, Mr. Reagan. He's a great He is a great, a great man, and I'm delighted that he's enjoying his retirement. Uh, but, uh, okay. Tell me once again how you think, that, do you think this would really uh, serve the public interest or you just think it would? I think would, it would. I mean, and, you, know, you know, it was mentioned something about entertainment value. You know, uh, you know politics does have an entertainment value and, and that is, uh, is not, not to be overlooked. No, I think it would and I'll tell you why. What happens is uh, good, decent people that want to know about their government and don't have the kind of unlimited time to watch all the different committee hearings and all the different things that are on C-SPAN and CNN and all those other good, you know, uh, electronic methods of, uh, of transmitting information would get a focus. And I think that the, the natural course of things would be that the leadership would choose an issue uh, that had some pertinence of the day. And so to see the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State uh, as the Soviet Union was disintegrating in the well of the House articulating American uh, policy in one focused event would be important. Uh, several months ago, a number of us held town meetings on health care. I think it would have been even more useful if we could have had as the hallmark a debate between Republicans and Democrats, uh, between the administration and the Congress over what the options are in health care for this country. Maybe the status quo is the best, some people would say. Maybe a Canadian system is where we ought to be going. What does the administration believe? What does the Congress believe? And I think it'd be helpful to get those things well, out in know, a focused kind of Let me end by, by, by just saying this, that I thought one of the, uh, the high points uh, in the, the relationship between the um, uh, administration uh, and the Congress came during the desert storm. And, and when uh, we, uh, as members of Congress, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense and the uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and came others 
came down uh, here and, and we had an opportunity, not on any sort of structured basis with committee chairman, it was kind of first come first. And you know, I, I guess I probably felt closer to the administration and closer in, in, the, in the fact that we were working towards a common goal uh, then, than, uh, than just about any other time. And, and you know, if it would bring about something like this, I think it would be very positive. And I thank you for, for bringing it before us. Thank you. Sam, you've alluded uh, uh, to the situation where uh, President Carter asked him to, to address the House of Tips, but turned him down. Was that in a formal? No, I, it was not formal. Uh, it was more of a back channel uh, kind of uh, offer. Well, it was a formal offer in a sense that Carter, uh, speaking to a member of, uh, of Congress, offered to come here. The offer was brought to uh, the speaker. I think the speaker thought uh, it unwise at the time. Mr. Chairman, would uh, you Mr. yield? No. <clears throat> Just uh, for the record, you know, I've, uh, I've been following this thing for years, and uh, <clears throat> one of our witnesses that will testify later from the Brookings Institute, Mr. James Sundquist, wrote in his Decline of Resurgence of Congress that uh, both President Carter and Vice President Mondale endorsed the proposal for a question period. Uh, there is no record of their having reiterated their view after their inauguration, and I have heard of no such thing. Uh, I don't think Tip O'Neill was ever offered that, to really. Well, I you, mean, uh, you can check with Tip. My understanding I is will. <laughs> that, that it was offered. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am absolutely stunned at the statements that have been made by my colleagues that they don't have the ability to communicate to cabinet members. Uh, we have the distinguished chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Fassell, here, and I know that if uh, Jim Baker testifies before his committee, I know that if a member of another committee has an issue which uh, he or she desperately wants to raise with the Secretary of State, that the very fair chairman of the committee would allow that member to come and at the end of the questioning from other committee members would have the opportunity to raise that issue. Tony Hall said that he's having a difficult time dealing with a cabinet official on some item and I'm sure that the committee uh, which has jurisdiction would certainly welcome Mr. Hall, a distinguished member of the Rules Committee, to join that committee during the hearing and raise whatever question uh, would exist there uh, for that cabinet official. So it seems to me that well, we're sitting here acting as if we have no ability to communicate with cabinet members when there's not a problem. I mean, uh, it, it seems to me that there really is an opportunity to do just that. One thing that I would like to uh, ask specifically of you, Sam, is this question of relevance. Now, who's going to make the determination as to the relevance of the follow-up question? Will it be the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who's a member of the majority party, who will make the determination as to whether or not a follow-up question is relevant? Or will it be the cabinet member who is there to determine whether or not the follow-up question is relevant? I mean, how, how is yeah, that going to be judged? That, I would suggest that we don't need relevance police. Uh, that frankly... Well, but based on the definition of what you've got here, you, you say that the follow-up question has to be relevant, don't you? Right. And I, I think if you look at the operations of the House, we have a number of rules that are similar to these. Uh, and that frankly, the members do a fairly good job of policing themselves. And again, this is a democracy and a full and open debate uh, even if a member were to step over the line of relevance uh, by a degree, large or small, I don't think it would bring the government toppling down. Well, then I think what you should do in light of that, Sam, is eliminate this issue of relevance. If it can't be well, determined we, and we don't have a relevance police and members are able to step over the line slightly, it seems to me there's no reason for you to even mention it. Well, if, if we could get your support by removing the relevance clause, <laughs> yeah. then I'd be happy to remove it. I just think that the best form for the debate is if the debate is fairly well focused and that the suggestion to members who are generally I think responsible and responsive to the rules of the house and its operations is that if we try to keep the debate focused in some way where there's a real dialogue rather than just skipping around on a number of different issues and so while there is no perfect way to force a member to ask an exactly very narrowly defined follow-up question I still believe the best way to proceed, proceed would be to have the follow-up question have some relevance to the primary question. What does this do to the committee process itself? Now, I know that if you would look to hold these meetings on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, most committees like to hold their meetings during that time. And it would seem to me that this would really undercut the committee structure which we have. Jerry Solomon very accurately points to the fact that we have way too many committees and subcommittees and people fall over each other. 
but it, it seems to me that uh, as, as you look at this, there's some chairman who might not be as inclined to uh, to uh, support this concept as uh, as uh, others might. Yeah. Well, I think that um, that uh, there's no one would argue that we're not busy enough here and that we don't have enough to do already. I think the advantage of the debate would be worth it. We do have four committee chairmen who are. Uh, co-sponsors. We have 53 co-sponsors in general and we have 16 subcommittee chairmen who are sponsors of uh, this proposal. And I think like anything else you have to weigh its relevance. I think for a democracy to have a debate between a cabinet secretary about national health care or however that secretary would deal with un Americans who don't have health care and the Congress to have a debate with that, I think it's well worth it. I think it's worth taking a bit of time out of our weekly schedule to have a dialogue with the administration. I think the point that I'm trying to make, Sam, is that that exists today. Yes. I mean, and, 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 and one could infer from what you're saying is that there's no dialogue between members no, of the I executive branch and the Congress. I think you have Congress. to look at the, the entire statement, not just simply one part of my statement. And I mm -hmm. think what I've said uh, a number of times is that what, what this would give us is a focus. And that, and maybe you're out of the room when I said this, that Presently what happens is with so many cabinet secretaries in so many different places, with so many hearings on so many different issues, it's hard for the public sometimes to get a focus on what, you know, is a singularly important issue in that sense and uh, that this would give us an opportunity mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. Look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Sam, I'd like to follow up on something that Butler raised. Um, the question about uh, how you make sure that uh, the real controversies get aired, uh, specifically when you have a committee that uh, has a very cozy relationship or is, 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 is in sync with the cabinet secretary. For example, uh, Veterans Committee, uh, Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Uh, there are some members in, on that committee and some members in Congress who feel very strongly on the Agent Orange issue. However, that I don't believe that the, the uh, chairman and the ranking member of the Veterans Committee feel strongly on that issue and would be more in sync with the uh, way the uh, Veterans Affairs uh, Department would conduct uh, its activities in that area. Uh, how do you really make sure uh, that there is enough time and that the uh, true controversies where you have strong feelings in the House actually get aired? Yeah. Well, that's why I don't, I don't give, as we do on the House floor when there's a debate, uh, primacy to committee members for the entire process. I would only provide uh, for the chairman and the subcommittee chairman uh, that opportunity. After that, I would hope that we would uh, go throughout the House and with frankly, uh, Butler and your point well taken, that we reach members who may not have a daily opportunity uh, to deal with these committee chairs. And, and what do you do where there are several committees of jurisdiction? Uh, we, this is not a neatly structured place, no, as you know, in terms of the way it relates to the executive branch. Specifically, uh, Mr. Fassell is going to be here in a minute. What, what, do you, what do you do on an issue like the loan guarantees for Israel, where you have the foreign affairs and the committee and you have the foreign ops committee of the subcommittee of appropriations. Uh, uh, do they both get their shot? Uh, and what do you do on energy issues where you may have a couple of committees? You may have interior involved and you may have uh, energy and commerce involved. Some, some things don't yeah, break down I wouldn't very give, uh, I wouldn't give uh, any more than uh, two individuals uh, and, and the, the opportunity to naturally go at the beginning of the process. And that would We'd have to make some choices, but I think there is a danger uh, that if you start doing every committee with some jurisdiction, that the rank and file members wouldn't have an opportunity. And I think by choosing two individuals, and uh, that what you would have is you would give those who have done the work, you know, usually there's a couple of people on each side that have led an effort. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the speaker or the majority leader controlling the time. Uh, G giving some respect for that effort that's been done so that uh, if a chairman's worked on uh, veterans issues for for decades there's nothing wrong with giving him the first uh, question but after that I agree with you that we want to get beyond the normal structure and I would hope that we would and if in in writing the bill and amendments that 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 would uh, make a lot of sense mm -hmm. I know that uh, uh, a few years ago actually uh, right before uh, uh, Jerry Solomon and I came to Congress uh, uh, I think in 77, we came here in 78, it was a major piece of energy legislation and you had to create a special committee uh, to bridge, 
to bridge all the uh, different jurisdictional questions, and it got very complicated because so many people had a piece of that pie. Yeah, I think that's, that is a general problem in the House, and I think whether it's in conference committees where you end up with, a, you know, a dozen different committees being, I think that's something clearly we need to deal with. I don't think that uh, you'd want to have that much representation in the opening uh, part of this process. I think, I think again, the majority leader uh, t choosing two that have the, the major effort in these areas of expertise would be adequate, and then after that I'd hope that they would go, frankly, in, in many instances to the least senior individuals, so those people uh, that get the least opportunity for an exchange in these areas. I have no other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, Sam, I am very much supportive of the concept and the idea that you're suggesting here. Uh, it just would uh, have difficulty with how we could get from A to B. In a parliamentary system, you pose questions to members of parliament. It's highly appropriate that a parliamentarian would answer a fellow parliamentarian. Uh, it's not un, un, improper that a member of Congress should respond to a member of Congress. If an independently elected executive then comes and sits in the parliament or sits in the Congress and responds, that, that's a quantum leap forward. So rather than go that far, let's just back up a bit. We in this country were the leaders in general aviation, producing small aircraft. We now don't do that anymore. The reason for that is that there is a products liability reform that has been languishing for over a decade in the Judiciary Committee. Rather than go to the, after the President, would it not be good if the members of Congress had the right to qu pose questions to the members of Congress who are refusing to allow legislation to move that is of interest to the nation? We could go on with individual retirement accounts and ways and means with over 300 and some co-sponsors. Uh, I could go on at length. But uh, I'd, I'd like your insights as to if we took this a step at a time. Yeah, I think that, um, that uh, as Mr. Dreyer pointed out earlier, uh, there's more than ample opportunity for us either on the floor when members uh, are in debate on substantive matters. Uh, we have the right to offer amendments uh, uh, oftentimes uh, with germaneness uh, uh, as obviously a control. Uh, so there is frankly ample opportunity for a member of Congress uh, to address the chairman of any committee, including the Rules Committee when he brings out a rule, uh, on almost any issue. I think additionally, what we're trying to bridge here, and I, I'm, I'm uh, as I indicated to Mr. S Solomon earlier, supportive of the efforts uh, frankly, that Mr. Hamilton and others are having trying to reform the, uh, the process that we work under. I came from a legislative body that had uh, joint committees, that the House and Senate uh, sat together in committees, and I think that, frankly, was a far significant way, uh, a far more significant and better way for a legislative body to uh, do its work. This is a separate I'm issue. I'm sure I made myself right. clear. My, yeah, my, this my, is a my point is, would it not be good to have question time to those leaders of the Congress that are, re that are yeah. accountable at this point before we then go to their, to right. their cabinet Let me levels. say two things. One is that we have that opportunity now in a very direct way, that every chairman of the committee in a short course of time around here ends up on the floor taking a bill out, and you can ask him directly on the floor, on the record, almost any question uh, in that kind of format. But my focus, my focus here is the relationship between the executive and the legislative branches. That's not to say that there aren't improvements we could make in how the legislative branch works. And, and I frankly would be supportive of a number of those changes, as I've indicated. Mr. Hamilton is looking at a number of changes within the legislative branch in the relationship between the Senate and the House. But I think it would be a mistake to put this off until we've made every possible and good reform of the Congress where this opportunity gives us a chance to, the, the executive really has almost two-thirds uh, of the Congress in its hand. As the, you know, the president vetoes a bill, two-thirds of Congress minus one is irrelevant. And so I think for the American people to understand that and to, and to see where the executive has power, that that's what question period does. The issue that you raise is something that I've, I, were you, I would bring to Mr. Hamilton as he looks to do a general internal reform of the Congress. I appreciate your response, and perhaps there's no other answer to it. But to, to say that they come before the Congress anyway it gets back to what 
David was saying that members of, par of Congress or me members of the cabinet come before Congress anyway. What you're saying is to set up a specific time where you go at specific questions. What I'm saying is that if that is good, then it also ought to be good to the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And if that is true, then that is a good place where we could start today. But I yield to the gentleman. I thank my friend for yielding. I think Bob makes a very good point here. And frankly, it's this committee which, through its closed rule process, prevents members from having the opportunity to really grill committee chairmen on issues. It's, it's uh, so often the case that, that a limited amount of time exists for debate on a measure that comes to the floor. And if we had open rules, which Jerry Solomon always requests every time we had this measure come forward, these measures if come forward, we would have a, a chance to do that. If I could so, answer that. I mean, I think that this idea of a specific committee chairman standing there to take questions on a public policy issue would be a very balanced way for us to begin this if, process. If I can just uh, defend the chairman of the Rules Committee, who doesn't need defense. Oh, he doesn't need defending. And yeah. I'm not attacking right. the chairman of the Rules well, Committee. They, you don't, uh, you don't, please don't defend Joe Moakley from me, okay? Yeah. Well, let me just say that if, if those who have watched the Senate, in my opinion, uh, that have the best understanding of how the Senate often doesn't work, uh, their suggestion is that maybe they uh, get Joe Moakley over there and have a rules committee. Because frankly, uh, one of the problems that happens in full and fair debate, and the reason that I have a limit on question period, not that it should go on for 10 or 20 or 30 hours, is that sometimes you just stop the process. By, by extending the debate to an irrational end. Now, I think that certainly there are lots of times that I've wanted more time. But on the whole, getting our business done, I think without the Rules Committee and the limits on time, that we would end up like the Senate, often one member holding up the entire body uh, for a very kind of uh, a basic reason, that they want something in their district, they want another piece of pork at it, Jesse Helms doesn't like a, uh, an ambassador being appointed to some country in Africa or Asia, so all legislation stops until a Senator Helms is happy. And I think that the reason the Rules Committee uh, rightly limits some of the debate, and I'm somebody that likes as much debate time as possible, is that without that, we would not get our work done. The simple, so I, would suggest, I recognize that, Sam. The point that I'm trying to make is that right now, under the present structure, with rules that come to the floor, I don't believe that every member has an adequate opportunity to challenge a committee chairman on a bill which has been bottled up in that committee for a long period of time with, as Bob says, as many as 300 co-sponsors on legislation. My, so I'm my just bill, saying that this would be, a, I believe, a very balanced way to begin your process. Yeah, my proposal would not give an unlimited amount of time to question a cabinet secretary on a proposal like health care, which the administration's bottled up uh, for some period of time. It would give us two hours to, to question a... Uh, a cabinet secretary, and I dare say that virtually every chairman of the Congress is on the floor for more than two hours uh, per month, uh, and often, clearly, if you average out his time in the session, uh, that clearly is the case. And of course, if you, spoke, if you spoke with a cabinet secretary, he'd say that he, he spent more than two hours in front of congressional. The gentleman, you'll briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, <clears throat> the gentleman wasn't here when, uh, in, when I made my opening remarks, but I had suggested Excellent that uh, Mr. Mike Gagenson uh, expand his legislation to, uh, to include uh, our ability to, uh, to talk to uh, chairman of committees on the floor. And one great example of that, and uh, uh, my friend from California alluded to it a minute ago, is uh, the legislation which removes the earning caps on Social Security. That bill has overwhelming support on the floor of the Congress, and yet it cannot be moved out of committee. You know what might And I'd like to ask symmetry. somebody on the floor, gentlemen, wait ahead, now. Right this ahead. is not the par British yeah. Parliament. Yes, we yes. we right have ahead. rules here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least so far. Here, here. Uh, the other thing I'd just like to make a point of is that somebody on the panel here a minute ago uh, I think was critical, I don't know how critical they meant to be, of uh, Sonny Montgomery, the chairman of the, uh, of the Veterans Affairs Committee, and Bob Stump, the ranking min minority member. And uh, I served on that committee for many years, and I can tell you uh, that both of them, in spite of what was said, have great concern for the Agent Orange issue. They have both moved legislation on the issue. Uh, it's a, it's a, a real concern, and, uh, and Senator Montgomery ought to be credited for, for what he does for veterans of this nation. So should Bob Stump. Yeah, if I may thank thank close, because I don't want to take up, a, I'd be happy to answer more questions, the time of other witnesses. It seems to me two things. Uh, 
uh, that no one has ever argued that the separation of powers or the president is somehow injured when the president invites committee chairmen to the White House and has a discussion with them on legislation on the president's ground. It seems to me that Congress ought to have the same opportunity to invite the cabinet ministers of this president and future presidents to the Congress so we have a discussion with them on our turf. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Th
government classification of documents and so forth is concerned. But I've joined with Lee uh, Hamilton, Bill Grattison, and others in co-sponsoring legislation to examine potential reforms in the committee congressional system. But the committees provide an unequal forum for in-depth, comprehensive, and serious oversight, in my judgment. The question then becomes whether or not a House question period for cabinet members would complement the committee structure, enhance the oversight work of Congress, and result in more effective government. I believe the answer to all three of those points is no. The question period would add to the reporting burden already shouldered by the executive branch. Just for example, the Department of Interior officials testified at 272 hearings in fiscal year 1989, 513 hearings in fiscal year 1990, and then 307 hearings in 1991. The experience of Interior is representative of that of other cabinet agencies. And uh, I think it would be a shame if the question period made cabinet members less inclined to appear before House committees. And we all know that. I, we've all talked to committee, uh, uh, to uh, cabinet members. Uh, I know I've talked to them in both uh, Republican and Democrat administrations. And they just feel real harried with the amount of time that they have to spend on the Hill before committees. And I think we have ample opportunity to question them without having to take some time of the, of the Congress to have a um, a question period. The format, the relatively short period for questions and responses, and the process in general could take us down a road of partisanship and confrontation between the executive and the legislative branch, which, exact, which is exactly the opposite direction from which we ought to be headed. Two months ago, the National Academy of Public Administration released its report, Beyond Distrust, Building Bridges Between Congress and the Executive presenting the results of a two-year effort to understand relations between the Congress and the executive branch and their impact on federal program implementation. I served as a member of the bipartisan cha panel charged with recommending ways to strengthen the congressional executive relationship. And Mr. Chairman, I have one of those uh, books here. That's the report. It's called Beyond Distrust, Building Bridges Between Congress and the Executive. And I'd like to just not put it in the record, but give you a copy for the uh, for the uh, Rules Committee and point out that, um, that that was chaired by a former colleague of ours, uh, Jim Jones, who was a congressman back in 1973 to 76 from Oklahoma and who now is the chief executive officer of the American Stock Exchange. And I, and along with other um, uh, persons, served on that. And I noticed that James Sunquist, who is one of the witnesses that you'll be hearing from shortly, uh, was, a, was also a member of that panel along with me. And the, the, the thrust of that was that we ought to find ways to strengthen the congressional executive relationship and uh, that that would uh, save us a lot of money and would really um, add to a better understanding not only at the top level but also at the uh, staff levels. The panel found that an increasingly competitive relationship and outright, or outright confrontation between the do, uh, two branches has a very high cost, a political system more and more unresponsive to the nation's problems and unaccountable to the American people for addressing those problems. Mr. Chairman, I remain committed to a strong, vigorous, and effective role for Congress. But as the NAPA panel found, there's no substitute for a substantive communication, information sharing, and constructive problem solving between the branches. H.R. Um, 155 will not get us there. In fact, it may take us in the opposite direction. So I thank you for letting me um, testify before you. And, uh, and in general, um, uh, I support the, the thoughts of the, uh, of the two uh, witnesses before you today, Sam uh, Gadison and, um, of course, our chairman, uh, Danny Fussell. But in this case, I think it would be a, an extra burden to the Congress, and I don't think it would really accomplish anything. And I think we ought to depend more upon our committee system and uh, make it probably more effective than what we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, say to my fellow New Yorker, Frank Horton, uh, let me commend him for the great job he does on government operations. We, uh, we all appreciate that. And, uh, at the same time, uh, let me, if I might, for the record, uh, well, no, this letter's to you, Mr. Chairman. It's from John Conyers, who is your counterpart on the government operations, the Democrat chairman, who writes so eloquently in opposition to this legislation uh, in a letter to 
So I won't submit it, but if, 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 if you want to, you can, uh, for the record. It's, uh, I have not talked to John Conyers about it, but I would assume that he would have shared the same views with me. Well, well anyway, he's, uh, he is opposed to it, and uh, his remarks almost are identical to yours. And then while I'm at it, let me uh, say that uh, our Republican leader, Bob Michael, uh, who is tied up uh, pursuing this economic growth uh, package, uh, could not be with us right now, and uh, if I might have unanimous consent to submit his statement for the record, which coincides with Mr. Horton's. And Frank, I thank you for coming before the committee. I won't you. take your time. Let me just uh, join Mr. Chairman in uh, expressing my appreciation to uh, Frank Horton. And uh, I have to say that with what Jerry Solomon just said, I, I, I was struck the fact that Bob Michael couldn't be here because he's working on what the American people want us to address most, and that is economic growth and jobs creation. But uh, the, the, thing that, uh, the thing that I do believe is that this uh, we got Attempt. some remarks from the peanut gallery back here. <laughs> oh, peanut gallery. Not from any distinguished committee chairman or anything, do we? Or, oh. let, me, let me just say uh, that I think that the attempt that you have made through this effort to uh, build bridges between the executive and legislative branches is to be heralded, and I think that we ought to look at trying to implement some of the proposals that have come out of your uh, uh, group here. Uh, before we move ahead with this kind of effort. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Oh, that's okay. I, you know. I'm sorry, too. Yeah, me, too. There's <laughs> three of us. Um, I appreciate this opportunity, uh, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman, to discuss this matter, and I support the concept that Mr. Gadenson has laid forth here is a very refreshing effort. Uh, and I, I've got some observations, having now listened to the testimony and the questions from the negative, to see if I can't in emphasize a little bit of the positive. Uh, we have a separation of powers. If there's a real constitutional question, and I'm sure somebody's going to raise that, let me remind you that as far as cabinet officers are concerned, we subpoena them all the time. They don't always show up. They don't always give us the information they want. And they always got a battery of lawyers to figure out why it is they can't do what they want. But theoretically, we can pose that challenge even with the separation of powers. And if in some way this resolution uh, or whatever action you decide to take were to present a constitutional question, then it shouldn't. You ought to resolve that whatever it takes to resolve it, and I'm not suggesting an amendment of the Constitution. Uh, the other observation I have is you really can't take politics out of politics. It's kind of silly to try to do that. I mean, you've got a Republican Party in control of the White House, you've got Democrats in control of the Congress, and if the twain meet at any one time, it is a marvelous experience. <laughs> now, when does that happen? Stop and think about that for a minute. I'll tell you when it happens. In the committee process, and I don't want to take anything away from the committee process. As the chairman of the committee, I got enough trouble. You know, I'm doing real good if I can hold a meeting. And I'm doing excitingly good if I can get a bill out. That is really something. Given the spread of philosophy on my committee from A to Z, to come to any kind of compromise on anything to allow you to move forward, is a real act of legislative skill, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> but that's, that happens in every committee. So there's nothing really new about that. And the idea that you could have a cabinet officer when he's testifying before your committee, when I've got over 40 members of my own, we can barely get around to the members of the committee. Although we do extend the courtesy to other members who are there. If we can work it in, we allow them to ask a question. You know. But that is a tough thing to do. But nevertheless, it's a valid observation. That is, if you're really interested, you want to go uh, nail a cabinet officer somewhere else on another committee, well, you can go there and spend the time, and eventually you might get a chance to ask him a question. And you might get an answer. And you might not. You know, it just depends on how he feels and where you are. Um, but when this, uh, I was very interested in, in uh, Frank Horton's report about bridging the gap between the Congress and the executive. Well, yeah, I served on that committee for a long time, many years. 
we worked like beavers to do something about easing the classification dilemma that we have in this country where everything is classified so that you just work like a dog to get anything declassified that that would be useful you know for a hundred and some odd years we classified the use of the crossbow in military maneuvers uh, and uh, it gets even worse than that in the in the in the classification system so you know we have some experience with it but bridging the gap is difficult what is the best way to bridge it the best way to bridge it is when the president says or the cabinet officer says i need those guys and then you watch all the barriers fall down all kinds of meetings take place broad across nobody worries about committee jurisdiction or whatnot right they come down with maps and charts and generals and secretaries and you got three four hundred members of congress we have a ball and we have the best communication that you ever saw. You want to bridge the gap between the Congress and the President, let the President take the lead to communicate with the Congress. And when he does that, he's always, almost always successful. Now why is that? We got two parties. We fight like cats and dogs all the time. That's what political parties are for. As a matter of fact, I have felt for quite a long time now, I'm not sure the country can afford the luxury of a two-party system. But you know, the democratic process is what it is. Nobody ever made a claim that it was efficient. Nobody made any claim that it was not costly. But as Churchill said, when you consider the alternatives, this is not bad at all. And the fact that we struggle and we go back and forth and we have these arguments and it takes us forever to do something, that's the way the system was designed. But when you want to move the fo country forward, if you take the President of the United States who takes the leadership to do it, as this President did in Desert Storm, when they come to the Congress, whether it's the President or the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Secretary of Health Education, and he wants the help of both parties, they can get it when they want to communicate. Now, I don't have any illusions that by having a question period on the House floor that you're going to have this kind of, of, uh, of uh, exchange and that you can drive this thing. I don't, I don't know that, that we can do that at all. But it would be an important part of the political process. And we all know what it will boil down to. It'll be, the, if, if this happens, it'll be the secretary putting the best possible face on what he's doing. And it'll be guys out here shooting at him from, a, in this case, be the Democratic side about this, that, and the other. Maybe even some Republicans. I'm not sure about that. But generally, the Republicans would be supporting the cabinet officer. The Democrats would be trying to find you know, and we'd have some kind of debate. It would not be an extended debate, but it would put before the American people in a way that hasn't been done lately uh, an opportunity to see this process. I think that's valuable. If we can do it without tearing up the Constitution, if we can do it without tearing up the political parties, why shouldn't we bring the American people into it? Just think if it had been possible to put on camera and before the media and before the American people the kind of conversation that we had with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs or any other cabinet officer, by the way, Secretary of State who comes before the Congress from time to time asking for the fullest kind of discussion with all members. That would be extremely valuable in my judgment. And so while it would be a, there would be a tendency on the House floor perhaps to go for the 30-second shot, you know, or the 20-second bite, but at least it's legitimate. People can see the difference. They can make their own judgment values. I think it's worth a trial. I don't, I don't know about mandating it, Mr. Chairman. I don't, you know, that raises all kinds of questions, but, and I, I'm not prepared to, to go into the legal side of the mandate, but uh, maybe it could be done some other way. Anyway, I think it's, it's, it's a worthwhile discussion that we're having. 
I think it ought not to be dismissed out of hand for political reasons because the Republicans see it as a challenge to the administration, et cetera. I think we ought to give it some serious thought. Leave the politics aside for the moment and see what's good for the American people, whether or not it would be benefit to them. It's always appreciated and enjoyed the testimony of our of our colleague and dear friend from Florida, but no, I, I don't have any questions at this time. Uh, Dr. when Sir. you're ta well, talking about a mandate, this doesn't mandate the cabinet offices to no, come. No, I understand. Okay. Mr. Solomon. And by the way, as far as the committees are concerned, Mr. Solomon, I, I, I don't know. Sam thinks that uh, out of deference to the committee chairman or the people who have been working on the issues and whatnot with the cabinet officer, they ought to go first. I'm not sure about that. I'm, I, I have no great fear that I'm going to lose something because somebody else is asking the questions. I, that doesn't really concern me. And I figure I'll get my shot at that cabinet officer when we have the hearings. I would much rather have people who are not involved in the committee work have the opportunity to question. That's the way I see it. The great value that I see around here in all the years I've been here is when we get all of the members of Congress locked up in a room with a cabinet officer. Then we really get down to business. And there are a lot of tough questions that are asked. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, let me say to Danny Fussell that um, he is, without a doubt, one of the most respected, the most diligent, and certainly one of the most distinguished members of this House and a really great chairman of his committee. You just don't say but. <laughs> 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 and I won't even say but. <laughs> but. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's a question of uh, some of us who are uh, somewhat opposed to this, uh, this kind of suggestion. It isn't a question that we worry about uh, uh, the President being challenged by the Congress. I think uh, those of us that share my view are worried about the impediment of Congress doing its job. But, um, y you know, um, on all of these important issues, uh, when Secretary Baker does appear before your committee, uh, or whomever, uh, Dick Cheney or whoever it might be, uh, you know, that's covered by C-SPAN, and it's covered by the press. And matter of fact, one of your committees is one of the few that is covered, uh, you know, on a regular basis by C-SPAN and by, by the press. So the American people really do get to see it. But, but my, my question is this. Can you imagine, now, seriously, can you imagine from what you have seen on, on television a few minutes ago with the British Parliament, can you imagine uh, a Ted Weiss, now, my good friend from New York, Ted Weiss, who, why are you who introduces? On Ted? Well, he's not even here. I'll tell you why, because uh, <laughs> I've told this to his face. So I'm not saying anything behind his back. But Ted Weiss, who who, who uh, introduces legislation to impeach, to impeach Ronald Reagan, is going to go on the floor. Can you imagine the theatrics with uh, Ted Weiss questioning Ronald Reagan? Can you imagine uh, my good friend Phil Crane? Uh, questioning Jimmy Carter, you know, uh, with some of the hard feelings that existed there. Can you imagine, my friends, can you imagine James Trafficant and the theatrics that would go on well, there? I questioning got uh, uh, George Bush. Got what, I'm, what I'm getting at, Danny, <laughs> is this, and everybody knows what I'm talking about, and, and I have the greatest respect for Jim Trafficant, uh, really. As a matter of fact, he votes with us quite often, and uh, <laughs> especially when it comes to foreign aid and some of these issues. But, uh, uh, you, you, you know, uh, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. We really have a serious problem. You know it. You know about all this sequential referral. You know when you have legislation coming out of your committee that your committee really ought to deal with and nobody else. And yet it gets sent to judiciary and it gets sent to government well, operations. that's a different problem. It's a, well, I know. My point is, let's get down and do the pro get to the problem that's really impeding this Congress. So that's my only objection. No, but well, I, listen, I, you know, if you, can, if you can do something about that, multiple jurisdictions, I'd, <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> we're, we're for that, well, you know. And again, I don't want to make, I don't want to have any grand illusions about what would happen in a question and answer period, but what's wrong with the American people? They're so used to seeing the warts on us now, what's a few more warts? I mean, people have got to understand what this system is about, and the only way you can do that is to have the people who are participating in the system be exposed to the people who are voting us in the office.
I don't see anything wrong with that. Let me, you know, let me, warts and all. We're no different than anybody else. My friend Sam mentioned the word king. And, you know, you just mentioned it indirectly, too. You know, I fiefdoms, did. fiefdoms, fiefdoms. You know, all these chairmen of all these subcommittees and their little fiefdoms, and Sam laughed in the back row. Ain't everything, anything going to be done about it unless we really well, get put ourselves I don't it. feel like I have a fiefdom. As a matter of fact, I don't even feel like I have a fief. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll yield back my time. As, a, as the chairman of an authorizing committee, and having to look down the eyeballs of the appropriators every day with the administration who could care less whether they have an authorizing bill or not, uh, how do we get anything done? We're going to go on a major bill here now by virtue of, quote, a silent agreement, unquote, conducted in the media uh, through unknown sources with a continuing resolution on a major piece of legislation that we <laughs> we have been dealing with for years. The gentleman just yeah. answered my question with a question. He says, how can we get anything done? Well, That's we did. We, we did. No, I'm talking about the authorizing committee. I'm just talking about the authorizing committee, just making the point. I'm not concerned about fiefdom. I'm concerned about getting work done. But, you know, why not let the American people see what the problem here is? Now, you, you, you guys over there, and I don't say this disrespectfully, okay? You want to get rid of Congress, you want to get rid of the Democrats, so you can have Republicans in the Congress and a Republican in the White House. And therefore, that would ease the problems for the country. That's the point you're making all across. Well, we kind of object to that, you know. We, we think we have <laughs> we, something we, to We say. do hope that happens in November, but... <laughs> no, I understand. I understand what you're doing. You know, American people are not stupid either. <laughs> they understand what's going on. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I. Uh, have to say that uh, there has really been a misinterpretation of what it is that we on this side are trying to do, Donnie. We don't want to eliminate Congress. We are not trying to involve ourselves no, in any Democrats. kind of... just Democrats. Well, we would like to see, after four decades no, of one-party control, we would like to see Republicans have a chance for maybe just a term or two to be in the majority in this House. I mean, that, that's all we're my asking. Right, it seems to me hey, to be reasonably my balanced. My ranking member can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Well, my ranking member here can't wait either. <laughs> but let me say that uh, it, it's, it seems to me, right, it, it seems to me that as we, as we look at this, Donnie, I mean, it is very clear that we have a goal of openness on our side. And I think that there is this, uh, you know, uh, there is this openness that is there. I got a letter here that came from a guy called Ian Austin, who is uh, in Canada, and he writes, he's the parliamentary uh, correspondent for a publication there. And in it, he talks about the tremendous advantage of the constant news conference, which the president has and other members of the executive branch have on, uh, on these issues. And uh, this information does get out. And in fact, he says that in the Canadian Parliament, of course, and we saw with John Major there and with Neil Kinnock, uh, they come with a great big sheaf, a stack, and their staff prepares them with every question, and they give them the answer. So this is all scripted. And don't think for a moment that members of the executive branch won't have loads of people writing every single question which we might conceivably ask here, uh, just as they do now for the committee process. And I so agree. it seems to me, well, it just seems to me that this openness, which you are saying you're for and implying that we're against, already exists today. No, no, I didn't say you were against the openness. Well, but I mean, the way, the way you have said this, Mr. Chairman, is that, that we are ones who are not quite as supportive of letting the American people come in no, and no, see the was, cabinet I, member I on the floor of the Congress confronting I members of the House? I wasn't inferring that at all. Okay, well, Absolutely I inferred that not. from what you had said. No, I, no way. No, 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 no okay. way. Well, I, I, I inferred that from what you said, and I just want the well, record to be very inferred. clear that we in the House uh, on this side of the aisle clearly want openness. No, just We want to be efficient. This guy closes his letter by saying, like our counterparts in Washington, we could find much better ways to spend our time. And I, I, I want to see us go ahead, and I want more openness. I mean, we're the ones who launched the disclosure effort last week on this check cashing thing from our side. We encouraged openness and disclosure. And I want to see us do that. I just want to see us do it in a very balanced way. And I think that deliberation over Sam's proposal is a, a very important thing, and we should ask every single question possible. Well. You know, listen, it's, um, it's a fresh concept, but I, if, if we're talking about trying to get things done, OK, 
today without having the eternal confrontation of a two-party system and a divided government. The one way to do that is for the president to take the leadership to bring the Congress in both parties. And it works every time. Now, it, so it doesn't have to be politics as usual. The American people expect that the two parties and the Congress and the administration can get together to work things out for the benefit of the country. It doesn't have to be eternal confrontation. Now, one way to bridge the gap, therefore, is to have more and better communication. I'm, I'm not certain that a question and answer period, uh, as political as that will be as once it gets started, or might be, will improve matters. I'm not sure it's going to make them any worse, but at least it will frame all of the issues, you know. And it might lead, it might lead, it's possible, it might lead to better communication if we start having the kind of dialogue that gets rid of the burden that we have to carry for our respective political parties. Mm -hmm. Well, you made it very clear that uh, any member who wants to come to your committee, and yes, I mean, they have sure. to sit there through 40 other members' questions, but we'll they have the opportunity to we'll, communicate. We'll try to give them the opportunity to ask. That's right, and I've done it before myself. I've been before your committee and asked questions at the end after every other member who was there but you know, uh, asked those questions. Just think back when we were in the caucus room, three or 400 of us, both parties there with the cabinet officer right there who's making the pitch, talking to all of us, and everybody got a chance to ask a question. We had no format. There was no stricture of any kind. We just sat there. We took the names as they uh, stood up to be recognized, and we went right down the list, Republicans, mm -hmm. Democrats, without regard to seniority, ch committee chairmanship, or whatnot. And the result of that was you had an excellent dialogue, exchange of views, and bridging the gap between the Congress and the executive. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Well, if we're going to be able to uh, accomplish and expand on that, I have no problem with this uh, yeah. proposal. But I think that there are I, a lot of other I tough think, questions frankly, that need to be answered. I think, the administration might welcome this opportunity to, to expand on the idea. Maybe they don't like question and answer. Maybe it doesn't lend itself except to a television with a 20-second sound bite. You shoot one guy over here, and he shoots you back. Well, but you as know, you said, the 20-second soundbite is exactly what will be carried off the floor of the House as well, a question is raised. we've got that problem now in all our debates. Right. You just listen out there. I can. So, I mean, this will not cure that problem, no, that is what you're acknowledging. No, I said you can't take right. politics out of politics. But it won't cure the problem of the 20-second soundbite. No, it won't cure that problem. Not as, not as long as somebody has to, you know, C-SPAN goes mm -hmm. from gavel to gavel. You've got to give them a lot of credit for that. That mm -hmm. takes courage and determination. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Mr. Chairman, please. Uh, no question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Are you going to be here when the team comes up? I hope so. Well, please, we'll please do that. I've, I've forgotten. Right. We'll call your office. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you, Dan. All right. Now, well, we're very pleased to hear from Lloyd Cutler, former counsel for President Jimmy Carter, presently with the Committee on the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My bottom line is that the question period is a moder modest improvement that's well worth trying. As you know, it's been very successful both in the United Kingdom and in Canada and in most of the Anglo-Saxon parliamentary systems. It informs the public in an interesting and Mr. Solomon and Mr. Dreyer in an entertaining way and there's nothing wrong with informing people in an entertaining way. Your party elected a professional entertainer who did that very successfully for two terms. It gives backbenchers a chance to raise questions, not only on national issues, but on issues of special importance to their own constituencies. And it gives cabinet members visibility before the public that they sadly lack today. I've been around here a long time. I couldn't name all the members of President Bush's cabinet. Certainly there are few, if any, people in the country who could name the members of the cabinet. They almost never appear on television in a way that interests people. I, I almost venture to say, I wonder if members of this committee <laughs> can name all the members of the President's cabinet. This, this, is, this nope, is no nope, time for an examination. I, I couldn't pass it, I couldn't pass it myself. <laughs> we, we <can> go. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> 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 
right. <clears throat> of course, there are obvious differences between the parliamentary system and the American system. In the parliamentary system, the executive is formed by and is responsible to the legislature, and the checks and balances are provided more by the rivalry between two very cohesive or three very cohesive parties than a rivalry between the branches. Uh, I think it was Mr. Solomon who observed earlier that we have separate branches exercising separate powers. I would disagree with that, Mr. Solomon. We have separate branches, I think, exercising shared powers. For legislation, you need the consent of the president unless you can override uh, his veto. Uh, he needs an appropriation from you to carry on the executive branch. He needs the approval of the Senate, of course, to make appointments and to make treaties. You share power. And in any system where you share power, you have to find a way to get together. And that's one of the uh, virtues of, I think, of a question period. I think it would be useful in our system because it doesn't alter the instinctive rivalry between the two major branches. It's clearly constitutional and has a historical basis, as <coughs> uh, Sam pointed out earlier. I think it's especially suited to times of divided government when you have one party controlling the executive branch and the other controlling the Congress. And of course, that's been true with us now for 16 out of the last 20 years and seems to be becoming endemic. You would have, because our party discipline is so, so much weaker than in most parliamentary systems, even members of the president's party will often take part and ask questions in a question period. And since the proliferation of committees limits most of you to two or at most three committees or subcommittees out of the total of 135 or whatever it is today, question time would give members a chance to ask questions outside the jurisdiction of the particular committees to which they're assigned. Uh, question time has the virtue of being in a debating format, and it has entertainment value and informational value. Debates are a very popular form of discussion. Look at the talk shows that attract people today. Of course, there are going to be, have you stopped beating your wife questions? Mm -hmm. And of course, there are going to be <clears throat> home run balls tossed <clears throat> by members of the administration's party. How many babies have you kissed this week? We can expect all of that. <clears throat> but it would provide a very valuable opportunity, I think, to see the members of the Congress and the members of the executive branch, not just merely the president, who we usually see today announcing only the good news, and that's true in all administrations, but we'd get to see his team, and we'd get to see how the team operate. Uh, it's only going to last, as I understand it, for one year. You've built in a sunset provision, so it, it is an experiment, and ought to, it ought to be recognized, frankly, as such. I've been asked to comment on whether the executive branch should welcome the question period. I think it's reasonably clear from what we've seen that the, the uh, party that holds the executive branch does not welcome the question period at this time. But I would remind you, of course, as you well know, that the presidency, while it hasn't changed hands too often lately, it changes hands more frequently than the Congress. And a question period might be very valuable to you when there is a Democratic Congress. As to whether the executive branch ought to favor at a question period, it seems to me it comes down to skills of its cabinet members are equal to the debating skills of the members of Congress, and whether the executive branch welcomes the right of an immediate televised reply to a bolt of lightning thrown by some member of the House. It would make debating skill an important qualification for office, and it seems to me that would be a very good thing. And it, I can hardly see how it adds to the burden, which certainly is a burden, 
of a cabinet member called before so many different committees so many times during the year. If this is to happen once a month or even twice a month, on average, a given cabinet member would only be called once or twice a year. So it's only an additional two hours out of his time, plus the preparation for a set of questions which under Sam's proposal he would see in advance. So I would say if I were advising a, pre a president on this issue, I would certainly favor a question time experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, would it be advisable uh, to provide some mechanism uh, for written responses to questions? Perhaps you can have when those responses appear on the congressional record. Do you think that would help? You mean as a substitute for the question time? It might be a useful supplement if there are so many questions for a given cabinet member that not all of them can be answered during the question period. But the ones that people will pay attention to, the ones that will be seen on C-SPAN and possibly picked up on the evening newses, will be the ones that are in the televised question period. So I would say it would be useful to do both. Have some in the question period and those that there's no time for answered with the answers printed in the congressional record and made public. We through the process of the proposals that more information could be elicited from the cabinet member. Through from the through the uh, from the cabinet member than it would be through some committee process. Uh, not necessarily, but it would be elicited in a public way on C SPAN and it would be communicated to far more people. Do you need my mic? Sorry. If, if C-SPAN has to run around covering 130 different committees and subcommittees of the House, plus all its, their counterparts in the Senate, C-SPAN can't possibly do that, and the public can't possibly watch it. I would dare say only two or three of the literally hundreds of committee sessions you have every day in the House and the Senate are, her, are watched on C-SPAN today. This would be watched, and it would probably be watched by a larger audience than the average committee hearing. Now, uh, you've heard the, <clears throat> the question about the Tip O'Neill, Jimmy Carter situation. I'm sure you were very close to that scene. You probably could open it up. Well, I, I wish I could, but I came to work for President Carter only in October of 1979. It was only 15 months before the end of his term. But from what I remember of President Carter, he was all for things like a question period. And uh, the, time of, uh, the time that you'd uh, probably be best proposed for the cabinet ministers to appear before the Congress, uh, would it be better during the day or after the official uh, work of the Congress has been done, so it would be better for nighttime viewing so more people could watch it. Do you have well, a mind? I think it's a question for you. Uh, I take it uh, the resolution itself uh, says, uh, after the disposal of such business on the Speaker's table as requires reference only and before the private calendar. So I mm -hmm. take it he had in mind the morning or the very beginning of the session. But I think that's a a matter of but I'm just asking what your opinion would be. I don't think it matters much because it would be the rebroadcast on C-SPAN, possibly in the evening, or if it was an especially interesting colloquy uh, several times in the next few days that people would actually see, rather than, I don't know that there are that many junkies who watch C-SPAN all day long. Warren Farm there are. Mr. Bielanson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's nice to have Mr. Cutler here. He's someone who many of us appreciate and whose, whose counsel we value. And, and I've got no, uh, you know, I've got no bones to pick with his own point of view on it. It's a perfectly legitimate one, and it's he's perhaps not, you know, not not wrong about it. The, what I where I come down, Mr. Chairman, and and, and my colleagues is that and this has nothing to do with the gentleman's testimony. Is that this this proposal really is not terribly important or terribly useful? Um, there are so many other things that need to be done and would be for, far more useful and far more relevant for us to spend our, our, our time on. I want to just digress for one quick moment to bring to the committee's attention some, uh, just a short two-page memo that was sent by Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. 
uh, which the committee members, I think, may have uh, before them, uh, in, in which he, if I may just quote one paragraph, he, he, he cites some, you know, some evidence to, to the effect that, in his, his view, it would not be all that worthwhile to do this. Uh, and I quote him, R.H.S. Crossman, who not only served for many years in the House of Commons and also as a minister, but was an academic authority on the British political system, concludes, quote, what most questions usually reveal is the capacity of a minister to evade an issue, end of quote. Lord Halsham, uh, another Halsham, another parliamentary veteran who has written extensively on the British government, speaks of, quote, the twice weekly exhibition of schoolboy humor in the House of Commons, end of quote. The Economist calls the question hour, quote, an undergraduate pastiche of a White House press conference, end of quote. Woodrow Wyatt, now in the House of Lords after many years in the House of Commons, describes question time in his memoirs as a, quote, useless privilege, a charade, a fake instrument of democracy, a Punch and Judy show. Uh, and one more, if I may. Nor does question time seem to work any better in Canada. Quote, anyone who has participated in question period, writes Professor James Gillies, a former MP, quote, knows its main purposes are to embarrass the government, to amuse the tourists and TV audiences, and to make life easier for reporters. It is, totally it is a totally ineffective way to elicit significant information, end of quote. Uh, let me come back only just for a moment, if I may, Mr. Chairman, to the point I was, I was making before that. Um, and, and this relates to a point I made earlier on, I think, when Mr. Gadenson was before us. This, this whole proposal, which, which has some obvious use and, and would be entertaining and, and therefore, in the sense of attracting people watching it, I suppose, might be instructive and to, to some degree, um, is not conducive to the thoughtful kind of discussion of public issues, which I and many of us believe very strongly is, what exactly, is exactly what's needed these days. I mean, it's, it, it's, as I said earlier, it's conducive to the kind of cheap shots. It, it becomes a kind of sideshow as Professor Campbell, I think, will say in his testimony um, later on. What bothers me is that we in the Congress, and I don't mean to, for us to take all the blame, because quite obviously there's, there's plenty of blame to, to go around. And as I said earlier, I blame the, the voters back home, too, for sending us a divided government year after year and then expecting us to somehow operate like, a, like somebody sent us here with the ability to do something. We, we simply can't uh, uh, do it. But we in the Congress, just to speak about our own, uh, about our own responsibilities, don't do our own job well enough uh, even now. What we need most of all, in my opinion, this member's opinion, not all members would agree, is much better oversight and review of government, of government agencies, government department heads, government programs. Uh, you get that through hardworking, uh, authorizing, and appropriating uh, committees. You don't get it through a, a two-hour, once a month, or once a year, or several times a year uh, session on the, on the floor of the, of, the, of the whole Congress. We need better work in general by most of our committees, as, as I mentioned uh, earlier uh, on. Uh, there's, so many, there's so many other serious uh, and, 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 and terribly necessary improvements that we need to, to make in our own procedures here in, in the House of Representatives and over in the other House as, as well, it seems to me, uh, that we should be concentrating on those things which would, which would have real results, perhaps, if we were lucky and worked hard enough at them in terms of our, of our legislative output here uh, than, than this proposal, which is, which is perfectly nice, it might be useful in some respects. In my opinion, it's not terribly important. And uh, I wish, uh, as I think Mr. Solomon or Mr. Dreyer, one of the two said earlier, that we would concentrate our attention this, in the coming months, first of all, on some, uh, some of these uh, proposals which are before us with respect to changing procedures uh, uh, of the House of Representatives before we worry about uh, undertaking this particular matter, which, to repeat myself, uh, even if it worked fairly well, would not be terribly important or have any real effect, I think, in the workings of the government of this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> May I just make one comment, Mr. Chairman? I totally agree with you that the issue of divided government is much more important, Mr. Bielenson, and that persuading people to realize what they're doing in giving up accountability of public officials when they pick a Congress of one party and a president of the other party is the most critical issue we have. I also agree with you there are far more important uh, matters relating to the structure and operation of the Congress than the issue of question period. But those criticisms of question period that you read sound very much like inside the Beltway or inside Westminster comments. It's an annoyance to some of the people who were running the government. It's, it's but I would guess myself that it would enormously interest the public. 
And if the question were put in polls, would you, do you think this is a good idea, the public would say yes, and the public would watch. Yeah, the public would watch, and the public, I mean, the public loves this kind of stuff, as you, as you know, <clears throat> let's say the gentleman. I mean, the public loves these, these talk shows, uh, which if you listen to them, I mean, are, are, are garbage. If, if, and I think I'm being objective about it. I mean, I, I have no, I'm not talking about whether they're right-wing or left-wing or middle-of-the-road commentators, but generally speaking, they're garbage. Uh, they feed people the least important, the least useful information. Uh, they help destroy whatever faith people have left in their, in their government. I mean, I tell people back home, it's not important. I don't care anymore what they think of me, whether they re-elect me or not. Uh, but we're just, we're just dragging ourselves down. We're destroying, we're destroying our whole form of government. We're destroying our whole faith in government. And there's no end uh, to the nonsensical, stu stupid little sideshow type uh, kinds of things that, that yeah. you know, that we can, I mean, the people, I don't mean to pe pick on People Magazine, they're, they're much better than, I mean, they're not political and they're not, but you know what I mean. Uh, I mean, Mr. Mr. Fussell was talking about seeing us warts and all. We're, all, we're human beings, you know, everybody's a human being. And uh, if everybody in the world was subjected to the kind of scrutiny that members of the Congress currently are, the world couldn't function. People couldn't stand it. People have no idea what it's like now to be a member with, of the Congress. With respect, a question period couldn't possibly lower public opinion. Yes, it could. The working as yeah, it would just, it would just if pile anything, on. anything, it will inform them more no. and perhaps bring them to the point where they realize the consequences of it. No, if, if you at some way, as others later on after you are, are going to suggest, Mr. Mann and, and others, of, of formulating times for debate within the House under special orders or other things where you, where you debate in an orderly manner major issues which are before or should be before the country, that's one thing. But if you sit here sniping at one another with seven or eight or 10 or 12 questions, uh, many of them will be very uninteresting to anybody except the, the, the person who answers it. Um, I mean, you see what happens. We saw on the TV show what happens you know, when, they, when they do it. And uh, it's, it's just, it's just going to be an added accumulation to the to the garbage that uh, that is bec that is is what the American people now is, is coming to understand or believe is 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 American politics. I hate saying this, you know. I hate saying this. It's a very non small d democratic kind of thing to do. But I'm I'm becoming more. I have been of years, and I'm becoming more and more of the opinion that there's no way this government can operate properly and tend to the better needs in, 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 a, in a responsible and wise fashion to the, to the needs of this country if absolutely everything is under scrutiny. I happen to believe, be one of the few, I suppose, who believes that the Congress of the United States, I mean, I know theoretically it's a horrible thing to say, but we would function better, there would be fewer problems abroad in this country if we didn't have television, if we didn't have recorded votes, as a matter of fact. The only time the Ways and Means Committee, I don't mean to pick on them, does anything responsible to be frank about it, or, or the Senate Finance Committee, which passes our tax bills, is when they shut the doors, keep the lobbyists out, and the members lie about how they vote, how they vote. So they don't have to come out and be attacked by the banking lobbyists, the insurance lobbyists, the savings and loan lobbyists, uh, and they can say, gee, I, I really tried to help you out on this thing to get you that tax break, but I was just outvoted. And, and they get together and they do the right thing for the country, and the only way they're able to do it is if the folks back home all of whom now are members, everybody is a member of a special interest group or other, every one of whom is, is communicated to on a virtually daily, immediate basis by whatever group they belong to. You can't get away, you can't do anything around here responsible. You know, you can't do anything about entitlements or 36 million senior Americans within two days have, have, have uh, written or called our offices. I mean, just to, to take another example. Uh, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's got to be a limit to this. You've got to give people a little space a little opportunity to do the responsible thing without all, all the time being attacked publicly on television uh, by people making political points. This is a to I'm making a totally nonpartisan speech here. It doesn't make any difference who you are or what party you're from. You cannot operate responsibly anymore in this body. We cannot, you know, with, with this, with with this, all of the all of this being uh, subjected to, to public scrutiny to the nth degree. There's virtually no way that any, any group of 435 men and women can do what's responsible for the country um, without subjecting themselves to such immediate and strong political attack by whomever is running against them from the other party, whatever the other party is. You can't, you can't do anything. You can't cast a vote around here, a responsible vote, without that vote becoming the primary, uh, the primary issue in your campaign next year. I mean, you just cannot do it. And one of these days, we're, we're, we're going to learn that we're, just, we're, we're snuffing out, we're suffocating our form of government. Uh, in a way that it's going to be anything other than, than a response to, to the dozens and dozens, hundreds of special interests uh, and not 
and not a government which can possibly respond to the, to the needs of a pluralistic society. You, I mean, you understand that, Mr. Culler, and I know we're not really arguing about that, but all I'm suggesting is that this is just, uh, you know, it would be all right, probably wouldn't be too harmful, probably wouldn't be too helpful. You know, I don't have any feel, strong feelings about this particular proposal, but uh, the last thing we need, in my opinion, is, is some more, is some more of, of this kind of, of non-thoughtful, non-serious scrutiny. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bellson. Any comment, uh, Mr. Well, uh, I don't think Congress or anyone else is going to be able to do away with television. Uh, we're going to have to operate in a society in which the public has access to information. And our biggest problem is to keep the public from being turned off by what the government does because of its ignorance of how the government functions. I don't think we lose much if if uh, the public gets to see everything inside the government. So I would come out, I'm, I share your concerns about how the government functions, but I don't think we can go back to the days when it took three weeks in, in a coach and <clears throat> four to get to Washington, and in which the newspapers, uh, in which it took us, uh, what was it, three weeks to find out about the Battle of New Orleans. In fact, we declared war in 1812 against the British without knowing that before we declared war, the British had acceded to our demands about stopping our ships. Well, we got, in, we got involved in fewer wars around the world when it took us so long to find out that they were even going on or that we might be needed that by then it was over. Uh, right. You know, here we get involved in President everything that goes on in the world. Everything that goes on in the world comes before us even as it's happening, sometimes perhaps before on CNN and we all you know, feel that it's necessary so for us to respond in some way. Fall on Baghdad. That's exactly right. But that's the world we live in today. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, before addressing uh, Mr. Cutler, let me, uh, I'm, I'm really taken by the, the colloquy that's been going on here with my good friend Tony Bielenson and, uh, and with you. You, had, Mr. Chairman, had mentioned uh, whether or not this ought to be broadcast at night, uh, you know, before a uh, prime time audience. And, uh, uh, again, my feeling is that it would it would replace Saturday Night Live. I mean, that's how much of an entertainment it would be. But I, and I say that with, with great respect for, for Mr. Cutler, but also with great respect for Tony Bielenson, because he in no way was, was suggesting we do away with television or, or things like that. I think what he is worried about is that this body is not an efficient body, and we need to be working, as he has said, uh, on reforming this body. And it needs it terribly, and I think you know so. Uh, you know, I served for the 12 of my 14 years on the, uh, as the Republican representative to the North Atlantic Assembly, which is the, the political arm of NATO, which includes Britain and, and Canada. And um, we have discussed this, uh, this uh, question period that they have uh, at length with both uh, the labor wings and the conservative wings of their party, and almost to a man and woman, they say it is a total waste of time. And they say the only benefit is that uh, twice a week or once a week when they do it, uh, it allows these backbenchers to, to come on the floor and, and get it off their chest. And, and it is a form of entertainment. And it's almost like the, uh, it's almost like going to the Gridiron Club uh, or the uh, National Press Corps here in Washington when they put on the spoof uh, shows of members of Congress and somebody takes the part of Tip O'Neill uh, and somebody takes the part of Jerry Solomon uh, uh, or the Capitol steps that uh, go around and spoofing Congress. And that's what it, it is in their eyes. And, and they, don't, they say they don't accomplish a thing. Well, God knows we waste enough time around here. We, we don't get the important things done. So anyway, having said that, let me, let me say to my, my friend uh, Lloyd Cutler, we have a great deal of respect for you. Uh, and uh, uh, you probably could serve in, uh, in most any capacity in any president's cabinet and, and do an excellent job. And I, I'll get back to that when we start talking about debating skills in a minute. But uh, I, I couldn't get you the pay raise. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but I want to thank you for your remark about uh, former President Reagan. Uh, 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 I talked to him just a few days ago, and he's doing fine. He's a great, great guy. But uh, last time you were in my office, Lloyd, uh, you were there uh, on behalf of Bart Giamatti, a great guy, too, and uh, who's passed away. 
I think, uh, was the president of Yale University, and you were there concerned about some legislation that I have that would expand the Solomon Amendment, which was law and had been upheld by the, by the, by the Supreme Court, uh, which denied uh, aid to young men who refused to register for the draft. And some of the Ivy League schools at that time uh, were upset that I was going to, uh, uh, with them, because they wanted to replace the aid I was holding up uh, with direct aid from the colleges to these kind, to this ilk. And uh, uh, I was going to withhold all federal aid to any university that, that uh, replaced the college loans I was trying to prohibit. And uh, you were good enough to come in and represent, uh, I think, Yale University and BART, and, uh, and he came in. And uh, consequently, those universities did not uh, get around to, to replacing that aid, and I didn't get around to pushing my amendment or expanding it. So everything worked out just fine. Uh, you mentioned uh, your point about shared powers vis-a-vis uh, -vis separate powers, which I had mentioned in my opening statement, uh, I think are very well taken because you said, quote, we have to work together. And that's what I'm so afraid about with this, uh, with this question period, that it, uh, it would just raise such hostilities. And that's generally what's happened uh, in Britain and in, and in Canada. And, and we, we don't need, that's what's right now wrecking the, uh, the economic growth uh, package. That we, we're trying to work together. And there's hostilities on both sides. And we Republicans are probably is as guilty as the Democrats. I don't know. We could question that. But uh, you brought up the point about debating skills and that uh, maybe whoever the president was would, uh, would choose his cabinet member because of, of uh, their debating skills against a member of Congress. Members of Congress usually get here, uh, perhaps all too often, because of their debating skills and not because of, of a real commitment uh, or because of, of uh, I don't want to say integrity, because I think all of us have integrity. But, but in other words, they, they get here because they, they are very good on the floor. Now, should we therefore uh, prohibit a Lloyd Cutler, who is a tremendously respected man, who, is, uh, who could do that good job in any position in the cabinet, whether it was in social services or transportation, I'm confident you could do the job. I don't know how good you would be on the floor debating. So therefore, would, would, would presidents then, uh, would they pick some clone uh, who they could prep? You know, they could give him all the papers and they could run him through the rehearsals and then send him onto the floor and the man wouldn't know the first thing about welfare except what he was cloned to, to go out there and give that particular day. See, that, that's what we're all so, uh, so concerned about this and, and why I really think we ought to get back to, to the real problems. And I think you would agree uh, that the committee system we have today is so cumbersome that it just doesn't work. It's so easy for one little uh, king of his fiefdom, of some little subcommittee, to hold up a piece of legislation coming out of foreign affairs when he serves over here on, on government operations. That's what's wrong with this system. That's why we can't get even get to the Rules Committee. That's why we can't get to the floor. And that's what we ought to be reforming. So just having said all that, would you, what do you think about committee chairmen and the, that, uh, that hold up this legislation? Because uh, as Sam Gagenson said, because they want to trade a piece of pork or something. Uh, what do you think about getting them? If we're going to do this, what do you think about expanding this program, this question and answers, to include the, uh, the uh, committee chairman, to, uh, to subject to the same grill? What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that's up to you. I, I think it, it might be very interesting to the public to see rank and file members having a shot at committee chairman who they think are blocking things. Uh, I, I, agree, I do think that an inarticulate person it certainly has a disqualification. It may not be totally disqualifying, but it is certainly a demerit in someone who's to be a cabinet officer if he cannot express himself capably, quickly, and to the point. I think that it's hard for me to grasp the concern that all of you have when committees already question cabinet members. There's a good deal of badgering that goes on. We see it on C-SPAN. What you seem to be concerned about is, while it's all right for committees to engage in this kind of vigorous informative debate with cabinet members, it's a bad thing for rank-and-file members 
to have a shot at doing the same thing in areas where they, where they don't happen to serve on that particular committee. I don't see why that's so bad, Mr. Solomon. Uh, it gives them a chance. Let's say you're on the Energy Committee and you, don't, and you come from a farm state and you want to get hold of the Cabinet Secretary in the farm state and you have a problem about something that's going on in your home district. What's wrong with having you have a chance to put that question to the cabinet member on national television? What's wrong with that if the cabinet member only has to devote two hours a year to submitting to that kind of question? There's nothing wrong with it at all. And as a matter of fact, members have, uh, all members of Congress, ironically, except this committee. Uh, on this committee, we are uh, prohibited from serving on any other committee. When I came off of Foreign Affairs and off of Veterans Affairs, I had to give up all other committees to serve here. And I'm the only one, along with these members here, who don't have the right uh, to or never see a cabinet member coming before our committee. But I still have the right, and I do it before my old Foreign Affairs Committee, with Danny Fussell, and I go with the, on that committee, and I sit up there as a member of the committee, ex officio, and when it comes my turn, I grill that cabinet member. I did it when I was opposed to my own president, George Bush, being uh, in favor of most favored nation uh, for China. You're and I very, grilled you're Mr. Baker. You're a very senior member. You have a lot of clout when you oh. come before Danny's committee. With, but suppose well. you've just been elected from Dubuque. With, with, with apologies and with respect, the chair is going to take advantage of the fact that the real chairman has left for a moment and say this, even though I have no right to two because I've spoken to some length myself. Um, we still have six extraordinarily able witnesses to hear from, who've, most of whom have spent the entire morning here waiting to be heard. So we'll go to the other three members in case they have questions of Mr. Cutler. Please, if you don't mind, for the moment, try to keep them short, only because I really want to give these other folks, all of whom have prepared statements and prepared testimony. Mr. Chairman, if that's the case, I would limit my remarks. And I thank the gentleman for coming before us. He's they, greatly respected. They are much more qualified than I am. <laughs> no, no, but um, Mr. Bonnier, do you care to ask questions at this time? Mr. Dreyer? I uh, recognize you're certainly, you're, you're certainly welcome to. I just no, no, I will to be very brief. And I just want to underscore what, what Jerry has said here and to, to you, Mr. Cutler, and that is I, I came here in 1980. And I remember very well many of my colleagues, freshman members, who would go to the disparate committees to raise questions of cabinet officers and other officials who come before them. Jerry Solomon does not have that exclusive right to do it. And uh, as he said, we, uh, by serving on this rules committee, we give up the opportunity to serve on other committees. This is an exclusive committee. And, and uh, I served on the banking committee and the small business committee. And yet I continue to have the opportunity to raise questions with them. And I did as a freshman member. I just had to, as Donnie Fussell said, wait until the last member of the uh, full committee asked the question. And then I would be able to pose that question. So that right exists today for every member you, of this house. And there are more than a few heard, chairmen. Were you seen and heard on C-SPAN back in your own district? Was I seen and heard on C-SPAN back in my own district? C-SPAN is. Uh, you know, carried on a wide range of uh, networks, and I don't know, I mean, uh, you and know, facilities. did you have facilities. a for the local television station? Uh, well, I, I think I had press coverage when I've done that in the past. Uh, and let me say this, you talk about this very limited two hours a year. How many detailed questions that every member wants to pose in the 435 districts around the country will be able to be asked in that two-hour period? We are now two and a half hours into this hearing, and as Tony's just said, we have a wide range of witnesses from whom we have yet to hear. And uh, it seems to me that you're not going to be able to get into the kind of detail on the floor of the House that you are in committee. Mr. McCune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lloyd, my question you need not respond to. I have only one question for both you and Norm Ornstein. And that is that in the biographies of the Nixon administration, it tells about in the final days that they all sit down around the cabinet room in August. And the president says to the members of the cabinet, the topic of the discussion this morning is inflation. And as everyone looks at one another, uh, Mr. Saxby of Ohio, the attorney general, says, Mr. President, I think the real question is whether or not you have the capacity to govern. Um, at this moment, if just to augment what the chairman said, at this moment, um, our capacity to question members of cabinet and members of the cabinet are just about the last thing that people are concerned about. Uh, we have been able to pull down the tent 
on our heads so effectively that at this moment, as America stands astride the world, economically, militarily, and politically, unlike it ever has since the beginning of time, as the whole world is looking to form two things, free elections and free markets like America has. And as all over the globe, nations are opening up the Constitution to say, how can I establish a representative government for myself? And they're traveling around trying to establish stock markets like America has. I, I fear that this institution has just about been committed suicide. I won't blame it on anyone else. I think we have effectively shot ourselves elsewhere. Uh, and so therefore, am I overstating the point or should we go ahead and is the main concern about the welfare of our nation whether or not we can get the Secretary of State to stand in front of it? Well, I certainly <coughs> agree, <coughs> Mr. McEwen, about the strengths and potential of this country and that we, to go back to Mr. Nixon's phrase, we become a pitiful, helpless giant when we have a divided government. We have to find some way to inform the public about what divided government does to them and to their own ability to hold whoever is elected accountable for what's been done. Every single one of you will say that the results of the government in which you participate are awful, but it's not my fault. And you're right because of the, the fact that government can't really function except in the foreign affairs field when one party holds the Congress and the other party holds the White House. That almost never happened in the 19th century. It never happened in the 20th century until uh, Eisenhower's second term. Every single president who was elected carried a majority for his own party in the House and the Senate with only three exceptions. Now we're the other way around. That's much more important, I grant you, than question period. But to change it, You've got to persuade voters that what they're doing, consciously or unconsciously, is a mistake. They ought to make up their minds to go for one party or the other party. To persuade voters, you're going to have to educate them about how the government works. They are so turned off about government, in part because they see and hear so little of how it really functions. Question period might contribute. That's my position. Thank you, Mr. Cutler, very much. Uh, we're going to take the next three witnesses as a panel, if we may. Um, Professor Patricia Sykes, School of Public Affairs at the American University. Professor Colin Campbell, Director of Public Policy Program, Georgetown University. And James Sunquist, Senior Fellow Emeritus of the Brookings Institution. We're delighted to have all three of you here. We appreciate the fact that you've had to, we appreciate your patience. Perhaps you've learned something in the process, perhaps not. And now we'd like very much to hear from you. Professor Sykes, we'll start with you, ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. Maybe the witnesses will hold just for a moment until we change our tape over here. I would like to thank the chairman and committee members for holding this hearing on this resolution, which I consider an important measure, perhaps not the most important issue before the current Congress, but an important measure nonetheless. Question period, I believe, could yield a number of benefits for the general public, for the House of Representatives, and for the President's Cabinet. Citizens could gain the opportunity to see representatives and members of the administration interact without media intervention and perhaps distortion. Generally, members of the House possess greater expertise than reporters, and the quality of the discourse will be superior to the exchange that often takes place on television talk and news shows. As an ordinary citizen, I would certainly prefer to hear a cabinet member questioned by Sam Gadenson rather than Sam Donaldson. In Great Britain, Question Time receives um, much more coverage and attracts a wider viewing and listening audience than other sorts of parliamentary activity. And the U.S. political system affords few opportunities for citizens to witness firsthand public debates that focus on critical issues. In this respect, Question Period can make a valuable contribution to our civic education. 
question period could serve the institutional interests of the House of Representatives as well as benefit the general public. It would offer House members direct access to a national forum and give them the opportunity to participate in shaping the national agenda. In contrast to your counterparts in the other chamber, um, House members lack easy access to a national publicity machine. Furthermore, true to its name, the House of Representatives reflects the cultural diversity characteristic of our country, at least much more accurately than our other institutions tend to do. And rank and file House members could place on the national agenda significant issues that might otherwise remain neglected. Finally, I think House members would have an opportunity to enhance the responsibility of cabinet officials. I doubt whether cabinet officials would render particularly blunt or revealing statements during question period. But they might anticipate being called before the full House of Representatives to explain and to justify their decisions. Anticipation of the event could serve as a useful check on questionable activity. In sum, the House of Representatives could benefit by creating its own national forum, by helping to shape the national agenda, and by enhancing the accountability of the executive branch. Members of the President's Cabinet could also gain a great deal from question period. The administration could use question period to persuade Congress and the public of the merits of its measures. Cabinet members might secure greater cooperation from the Congress as a result of their participation. Their willingness to participate could foster good feeling between the executive and legislative branches and perhaps help to mitigate some of the tensions endemic to divided government. Of course, question period is a characteristic of parliamentary systems, but a, a system of separate institutions sharing power might need it even more, particularly in a state of divided government. In fact, some of the Republican opponents of this measure might want to contemplate a possible outcome of the 1992 elections. Consider how question period would operate when we have a Democratic White House and a Republican House of Representatives. The partisan composition of our institutions could change, but divided government is likely to continue to characterize the American political system. Question period could provide many benefits, and I foresee no serious costs. Some opponents fear that the practice would intensify partisanship, but I think that result is highly unlikely. Skeptics of the proposal have witnessed some of the fierce and rancorous partisan conflict that takes place on the floor of the British House of Commons but that probably wouldn't happen here for several reasons. Normally, partisan lines are less clearly drawn in the U.S. Congress and in the public. And members of Congress tend to operate relatively independent of partisan tyranny. In fact, given some of the cleavages in our major political party, the administration might well encounter its harshest criticism from its own partisan ranks. Indeed, this often happens in Great Britain, as anyone knows who's witnessed the recent debates on the European monetary system. Furthermore, the culture and the rules of the House of Representatives encourage civility, recent events notwithstanding. To put it bluntly, House members rarely put things bluntly or speak harshly to each other, as members of the Parliament are so often inclined to do. I think differences between the US and the UK, cultural, social, and political, ensure that question period would operate very differently on this side of the Atlantic. In conclusion, neither supporters nor opponents of the measure should expect dramatic change as a result of the proposal's passage. Representative Gadenson has made a proposal that is both modest and experimental. Question period would take place only during the 102nd Congress, and its success would depend on the voluntary cooperation of the administration. Ultimately, several external factors would affect the nature of the practice, including public opinion, presidential popularity, social and economic conditions. In any event, the proposal would not make the U.S. political system much more like the British Westminster model. But as I indicated earlier, I believe a system of separate institutions, especially in a state of divided government, could derive different and perhaps even more essential benefits from the practice of question period. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was excellent testimony. I think you made about as good a case for the question period as, as could be made. Uh, Professor Campbell. Uh, yes, I, too, uh, submitted a, a written uh, 
Uh, yes, sir. And, the, and the, I'll advise all, all, the, all, the, uh, all the witnesses. I should have told it. you beforehand that, that yeah. there being no objection, the full text of your testimony will be included in the record. So you're right. more than welcome okay. to summarize it if you yeah. like. Uh, so let me just uh, touch on some highlights. Um, I think that this is a very modest proposal uh, indeed, and uh, I don't see it uh, as potentially threatening in any uh, serious way. Uh, I, I certainly uh, can recognize some of the points that the uh, acting chairman made about the overexposure uh, to the media, which occurs all through uh, the system as it is right now, but this is certainly the case of all political systems in the world when you travel around to places like Singapore and Thailand, you see parliamentary debates being, uh, being televised just like uh, here in the United States. So overexposure is very much part of the, uh, the game these days in legislative life. Also, I think that in the United States, um, individual congressmen should not uh, be threatened by a proposal like this. It will not be turned toward them. It will be turned toward the executive branch. And God knows in the first place that congressmen have one of the highest or the highest survivability through elections of any legislators in the world. Uh, so uh, That's going to be sorely tested this year. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Well, it, it will be, but uh, I think you can probably cushion the blow of a 12% uh, turnover, uh, which is the type of thing you're probably going to get, 2 or 5% or more. Um, I think that uh, really one issue that, is, that comes through some of the discussion is what are you really looking for uh, in these types of exchanges? I, my experience as a Canadian and someone who used to be uh, president of the Canadian Study of Parliament group is that uh, people in parliamentary systems look longingly, at least some people do, uh, to the committee systems because you can really get into detail in a way which you can't in, in Parliament. In the first place, the government normally com controls uh, committees and committees don't investigate things unless the government approves except in rare cases. So the ability to break out of that and to uh, confront uh, the executive branch is, uh, is very limited. So Question Hour performs a tremendous service uh, in that regard. But one of the great difficulties uh, I find in the United States is that it does take time, nonetheless, to get the inquiry system of a, through committees running. And sometimes the most crucial period of a crisis is lost uh, in terms of galvanizing public opinion and giving people a sense of how the executive branch is, is dealing with it uh, because there's no more immediate way of uh, having officers of the executive branch come and answer questions. So I would say the strength of the parliamentary system is that it, can, it has an, an immediate impact. And I, this might even work not just in, 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 uh, when maladministration or scandals uh, crop up, but when you have a paralyzed administration, I think it would have been an immensely beneficial to the Carter administration if they had, did have a question, a question period every month. Uh, because people would start taking inventory in and in a wider scan of what in heaven's name it would be, was accomplishing. And it would have given the entire administration a, greatest, a greater sense that at the end of the day, the bottom line is what are we accomplishing? And so this can, I think, could conceivably be an immensely beneficial uh, dimension to the system. Some people have raised the question about who would referee. The, uh, the speaker and the minority leader would decide which questions are going to be asked, but then when you get the supplementaries, who's going to recognize a certain supplementary and, and object, uh, 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 recognize objections about another supplementary? Well, in, in uh, parliamentary systems, you, the speaker is a member of a party, but he recuses himself from active involvement in, in the party. You could, you could assign a member of the House to be the designated moderator, agreed upon by all uh, both parties, unanimously if you wish, uh, to assign someone to be designated moderator. That's just a very tiny little uh, technical thing that could be accomplished very readily, and I think that they're probably uh, members of this very committee that, who uh, have the, that type of recognition and standing uh, within the House on both sides that they would be able to accomplish that without any great difficulty. I think there have been some things, uh, that one problem that I have with the proposal is that you follow more the British model than the Canadian model and, and frankly 
I, I, in each case, the systems are extremely adversarial, and you want to, I think, avoid some of the, the detrimental dimensions of that. But by the same time, you want some level of spontaneity. In fact, in Canada, the ministers do not come, as the congressman said, uh, so I'm correcting him here, Congressman Dreyer. Uh, they do not come with, hu uh, with huge briefing books. They don't know for sure what they're going to be questioned on on a certain day. If they started to read their scripts, as you saw, uh, to even, even very uh, totally predictable questions, uh, here's the prime minister reading a script. In Canada, if a minister were to do that, that would be auto almost automatic verification of incompetence. Uh, the, the, whole, the whole name of the game is to stand up and fi under fire, show that you can think on your, f your feet and knock the opposition down. And so I, I'm not, I, I really have a certain amount, to, I'm, I'm hesitant uh, to, uh, to uh, support this idea of uh, previous vetted questions. It, in order to avoid questions of detail, you have a convention whereby you can submit questions uh, for detailed and written answer. The, the British House has such a, a process, and the Canadian House has such a process. So the, 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 uh, the generally, the person that you would assign, uh, would, who what I would call the designated moderator, or you could come up with a, another name, he, he, would, he, would, he or she would be the one who would determine the order of the questions and who was going to ask questions. You could or could not have written notice. I would go for not having written notice. But also, that individual could determine whether there were some questions which would be more aptly addressed uh, if they were in written form and therefore would require, the, would allow for the type of detailed response which a, a department would, would have to uh, have. So at any rate, now the final thing that I, I would like to say is that this is a two-edged sword. I fully expect that uh, the minority members of this committee will be supporting this proposal very strongly come Janu January 1993. Uh, it, 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 it is something that serves it is something that serves the party that is not in power, does not have control of the executive branch more than the party that, that, that does. But we, ha we have to recognize that, that, um, that uh, the one, one thing that does come through this for all congressmen, regardless of party, is the whole issue of visibility. If there's one defect with the American system right now, and it's been re referred to from time to time, is that we get people who have really, about, the public, about whom the public knows practically nothing, uh, assuming uh, key roles in the executive branch, even the presidency. And if you had a device like um, uh, Question Time, you would allow uh, members of the House with, who are truly capable as, as debaters and are working in significant ways in tracking the executive branch on key executive policy issues, you would have a forum in which they could rise in the House and, and articulate their questions and then follow through with supplementaries and people would get an image of a different type of leadership than what we're getting through the sound bite oriented uh, selection process that we have right now, which I'm afraid to say ends up with not the best candidates imaginable. And uh, just look at the five survivors right now and uh, on each side of the house, and I don't think frankly either one of them uh, stands up uh, to the standards of leadership which exist in parliamentary systems. I'll end my comments by saying that John Chrétien, the leader of the Liberal Party in Canada and the leader of the opposition, was in, month, uh, in town last month. I, was, I went to uh, SICE uh, where he gave a speech. I was sitting beside a gentleman who was uh, uh, a lawyer in town and seemed uh, very knowledgeable about to Canadian affairs and trade relations in particular, and he stopped in the middle of uh, the question's question and he said, if this man were to decide to run for president, he would completely wipe out the current opposition, regardless of party. Why? Because he was asked questions that came from absolutely nowhere, and he had a, a totally spontaneous, unprepared answer for every one of them. And the reason being, the reason why he had, he had this tremendous skill was standing under fire in precisely this situation now for, some, for over 20 years. This man has been exposed to this system, and his acuity as a result of that is the type of thing that we're looking for in, in our, the leaders that we want to be serving us in the future. You should come to our town hall meetings. Actually, those answers are practiced. Uh, Mr. Sunquist. Thank you. <clears throat>
I, in terms of the question period being a means for Congress to get information that it otherwise wouldn't get, I think. Well, <coughs> Thank you. In terms of uh, the question period being a means for the Congress to get information that it otherwise wouldn't get, <clears throat> I find myself in agreement with what Mr. Horton and you, Mr. Chairman, had to say earlier, that the results would be negligible. I cannot uh, imagine that, that very many questions would be raised that had not already been raised in other forums, primarily in committee and subcommittee hearings and of course in the uh, media conferences that cabinet members uh, undergo. So the question and answer period would tend to be a repetition in summary form of uh, what is already on the public record in one way or another. In fact, uh, since questions are submitted in advance, if the uh, cabinet member wanted to evade a question that he had evaded in committee, uh, he would find uh, plenty of time to prepare a smooth and convincing uh, way of, of avoiding the question. And as Mr. Schlesinger's comments pointed out, um, the first thing that a uh, <clears throat> member of parliament does in rising through the ministerial hierarchy is to learn how to give a smooth and effective evasion of an unpleasant question. Indeed, I think the cabinet member would, member would be very careful not to give information that he had denied to the committee because if he had appeared, say, before Mr. Fassell's committee and had been unresponsive, then to be, to be responsive on the same point on the floor um, with a question asked by some junior member not on the committee, he would only uh, serve to alienate to Mr. Fassell and, and the other members of that committee. So this would be a repetitive procedure that would give the Congress uh, virtually no information it doesn't already have. Uh, except perhaps for the little local uh, uh, constituent-oriented questions that really don't deserve the attention of the f full House of Representatives anyway. So the um, question period would have to be justified, it seems to me, for other reasons. And that would be uh, particularly the impact that the televised, televised proceedings would have on the public at large. I tend to agree with the Masaiks that uh, the more that the <clears throat> public uh, gets to see the government in action, the better it is for all concerned. I think these proceedings would tend to be dignified, particularly since the resolution is, is widely, uh, wisely excuse me, written so that the, it's under the control of the majority and minority leaders. And the kind of questioning that uh, might prove embarrassing to, to the Congress uh, would certainly be excluded. If uh, the cabinet member were central in a, in a hot situation, uh, if the Secretary of Defense, for example, were uh, standing up uh, answering questions at the time of Desert Storm, or the Secretary of State were there answering questions uh, about a diplomatic crisis, I can imagine that the, uh, the Congress and the cabinet member would have the biggest audience for any governmental activity uh, apart from the President's State of the Union message and perhaps an occasional impeachment proceeding. <clears throat> and while the um, proposal permits a follow-up question, the Cabinet officer would always have the last word. <clears throat> the format provides for nothing like equal time or genuine debate. And half the questions would be asked by partisans of the administration in power who un would undoubtedly, in baseball vernacular, toss up pat balls for the cabinet officers to knock out of the park. The question period would thus give the administration in power an extraordinary opportunity to score points in the national political debate before a national audience. At the present time, for example, whatever cabinet member was being questioned would no doubt be asked a friendly question that would enable him or her to reply with a powerful plea for the President's economic program and perhaps to vigorously chastise the Congress for not having enacted it forthwith and as written. The process would thus reverse the relationship that now exists in committee hearings where the legislative majority is always in control, can catch the witness off guard with unexpected questions not submitted in advance, pursue their questioning at length, and have the final comment. 
That being the case, one wonders why the sponsors of this measure are not primarily from the party that stands to gain the most politically, that is, the party that controls the executive branch. I realize this proposal is not being presented in a partisan spirit, but the original sponsorship by 41 members of one party and no members of the other does not conform to the usual contours of a bipartisan effort. If I were a member of the current minority party in the Congress, I would be enthusiastically for H.R. 155. If I were a member of the majority, and if I had any partisan instincts, they would lead me to be wary of it. <clears throat> However, not being either, I can give it a mild nonpartisan endorsement. I do not think the proposal would significantly improve communication between the branches or enhance the flow of information from downtown to Capitol Hill, and it cannot avoid the risk of degenerating into partisan bickering. But at best, it could prove constructive in attracting wide public attention to national issues, serve an important educational purpose, and increase the respect of the people for their government and its leaders. Moreover, I am in principle in favor of experimentation in the whole area of executive legislative relationships in the hope that out of experimentation can evolve institutional devices and practices that may mitigate the debilitating degree of conflict, stalemate, and deadlock between the branches that seems inevitably to develop when the government is divided between the parties, with neither responsible or accountable to the people for results. The trial of the question period might lead, for instance, to further experimentation, such as converting the question and answer format to a debate, or permitting cabinet officers to participate regularly in floor consideration of legislation, as was seriously considered in the 19th century, or eliminating the incompatibility clause in the Constitution to permit members of the Congress to be appointed to executive branch positions without losing their seats. I, I couldn't agree more with what Mr. Bielenson and Mr. Cutler had to say about the, the central problem being that of divided government. Uh, the conflict, the stalemate, the, the deadlock, the, uh, the partisan maneuvering back and forth, the um, absence of responsibility and, and uh, accountability of the public uh, are questions that uh, I would hope if we get into something like the question period and get in a mood for considering and experimenting with other devices, uh, that, that question could be seriously tackled. I would hope that the committee that Mr. Solomon was talking about uh, might uh, have that as, as a uh, central piece of its agenda. Relations between the branches are bad enough that we ought to be considering a wide range of experiments, and the question period is as good a place as any to start. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Sundquist, and I apologize for not being in the room for the testimony. I have some people in the office. Uh, Mr. Villanson? Thanks. Just very briefly, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the, our three witnesses were, each one of them, excellent, even though their points of view were, were somewhat, somewhat uh, different. They were very thoughtful, very reasonable, and uh, in this gentleman's opinion, very helpful to, to the to this uh, committee. In, in fact, I frankly uh, wish, wish we'd had you all on earlier so we could have spent more time talking to you about not only this but some other things that some of you have, have mentioned. However, it is late and you all were very clear in the points you made and as I just said, they were very reasonable and well, well thought out and so I don't really have any questions I need to ask, uh, ask Mr. Chairman except to say again that uh, these, th these three, these two gentlemen and this, and this woman were excellent, excellent witnesses I thought and very helpful to the committee and thank you. Thank you. Solomon. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, because of the time constraints, let me, uh, perhaps if the witnesses would not mind, uh, we could submit questions to them uh, at a later time and uh, perhaps get some pertinent uh, answers right. to them. I, if they don't object, I would ask that unanimous request. With, without objection. Uh -huh. And uh, let me just make a couple of brief remarks um, uh, to Professor Sykes. Uh, you say the Republicans might consider a possible uh, Democrat president. Uh, and I think uh, Colin Campbell, uh, Professor Campbell, uh, alluded to that too. Uh, I don't think there's any chance, <laughs> chance of that. Uh, uh, of the American people uh, are not going to turn, uh, I don't believe, the, uh, the government over to one party, uh, especially considering all these things that are happening. But uh, 
Let it, and uh, let that's, me just. That's an unbiased statement, of course. <laughs> I was just going to add, I also said there would be a Republican House of Representatives. So. Uh -huh. Well, you know, in a speech I made the other night, I said maybe they ought to throw all of us out because then we Republicans would come back with a 101 vote majority. <laughs> so maybe that would be, uh, would be nice. But let me, uh, uh, let me just say uh, that Professor Campbell. Uh, mentioned that members should not worry about the, uh, the question period being turned against them. And uh, they don't, uh, that isn't what worries members. Uh, most of us really would relish it. I, for one, I really enjoy sometimes the give and take. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and it, so I don't worry about that. Uh, our concern is that it will impede, uh, impede this body. And, that's what I want to submit to both uh, all three of you in the question period because um, I am one of the sponsors of the legislation for Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Gratison, and I have my own bill which would set up a, uh, a bipartisan, nonpartisan uh, task force made up not just of members of Congress but uh, perhaps former members of Congress because we find that uh, once members have served here and now they're no longer here, they, they don't have those fiefdoms we've talked about to protect. And their views change considerably. And you see that uh, with, with all kinds of uh, former members making statements in support of various legislation. And that's what I would hope because, uh, again, we have so many subcommittees and, and joint committees and select committees, and the system just does not function, believe me. And that's why I really would, uh, would hope that we would have have your input, uh, you know, on that subject. Uh, the uh, question of debate uh, skills has, has been brought up. And uh, again, I just wonder what would happen if this is carried to fruition uh, down the road over the years. Uh, what really would happen? And uh, uh, Professor Colin Campbell uh, is evidently a very good debater, I think, in his profession. Uh, he would be terrific on that floor. But uh, suppose he were debating um, a Lloyd Cutler, who is a, a very low-key, quiet, tremendously capable individual. But how, how would that work out? And should we, would, should we carry this into the Supreme Court? Uh, should uh, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor not be uh, considered because she doesn't have a debating skill over someone else? I just, I just worry about all these things. And, uh, uh, but the main thing is that I, I feel that, as Mr. Cutler has said, and some of you have alluded to, that uh, maybe the American people needs to know how important it is for one party to control the, con the uh, Congress and the White House for a four-year period so that that party could be held responsible. Now, they don't know. And what I'm afraid of is if we get into this, this kind of thing, it is further going to de degrade this institution, and people are going to look worse on us than they do now. And if so, then that's going to further divide. They're not going to be willing to turn over control to either party, and they're going to go along with the status quo, and the status quo isn't working. So uh, having said all that, I, I would like to submit those questions to you and ask your opinion on this legislative system that we have and how you would recommend as outsiders that we could improve it to make the system work. But again, you all were eloquent, and uh, I, for one, appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sala. Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two quick questions, if I may. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Campbell, you mentioned about in the Canadian Parliament that it's very improper for cabinet members to respond by reading. Uh, is that, that's unique to the Canadian? Well, the Australian House is very similar. Uh, they're, they're, they do come in with more props than they, than they do in the Canadian House, but uh, uh, generally, the most scripted uh, performance in question hour among parliamentary systems is what you saw there, uh, you know, in, in the British House. But, but in the British House, the, they are, cabinet yeah. members are, per yeah, sorry, yeah. In the British House, yes, they are um, permitted to read. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. okay. And then uh, I, I just find it novel, and I just want to touch it a little bit more, that, that you literally find a direct correlation between leadership skills and the capacity to articulate effectively on your own. Well, I think, uh, you know, very much part of uh, leadership is maintaining a high degree, a high 
a sense, a, a strong sense of the response that uh, people are, are having about whatever it is that you have proposed or are advocating. And uh, I think one of the great problems with, uh, for instance, the Carter administration was that those dyna dyna dynamics were, were broken down, that uh, okay, the administration see. stopped worrying about what type, how the public was responding to this Rube Goldberg machine which was operating all through, you know, trying to perfect uh, all forms of policy. And, and, you know, basically, uh, I, I think that uh, the, the type, the reflexes of the type of person who, have, who uh, has been um, brought along within this tradition are, are such that they, they recognize uh, almost instinctively uh, types of actions which are, are going to, which they, they themselves know are, they're not going to be able to but defend. But the, or the glibness not, doesn't necessarily correlate with that either. Uh, one, one might assume yeah. that Mr. Reagan had a great feel for his audience. He could tell, he could handle an audience and feel an audience and yeah. feel a people perhaps far better than the average politician. And yet I don't think that spontaneous glibness was his well, specialty. Yeah, but by the same token, look, look where the country ended up uh, 12 years later. Well, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> OK, OK, that, 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 that was my point, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in a poll that was taken in 1984, yeah. Yeah. in which they asked repeated questions, do you agree with Ronald Reagan on aid to the contra, on equal rights amendment, on et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down? Do you agree with him on, on tax cuts? Do you agree with him on defense buildup? Do you agree with him on nuclear freeze? Oftentimes, people would disappear, would, would not support him in vast numbers on those particular items. One question, very interesting. Do you consider President Reagan a leader? 85% of all Americans responded positively. Well, and I therefore, would, that directly correlated as to who yeah. they chose for that position. Well, it, and so what you said in your testimony, to which I yeah. wanted to probe slightly and to yeah. which my response was absolutely correct to what I anticipated, yeah. is that you see a direct correlation between glibness and the capacity to respond spontaneously in a debating contest with the capacity to lead. And I just found it novel because it really has nothing to do with the topic before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, no, I, I, I no, I, I think that, uh, that uh, what you, that, that doesn't have your, to do formula, your formula, your formulation, I think is, uh, is interesting, but it's, it's, uh, it's really uh, uh, wide of the mark because what I'm saying essentially is that if, if you had this mechanism, Mr. Reagan would not have been exposed, President Reagan would not have been exposed uh, to questions in the, in the House of Representatives, but members of his, of his administration would yeah. have. Let's, let's and let's, therefore, let's, the public okay. generally uh, would have been much more aware of the consequences of the, of the various proposals and actions which okay. the administration Fine. were taking. Fine. And Thank they you. would have a much better scan of the, of the uh, aptitudes of these people to actually deliver upon the, the types Fine. of obligations and commitments okay. with they, which the, they the, made. The further you now, go, the further well, now, you go, the more off the, off the no, point. No, we don't Your we don't political have a position is either. interesting. Your political yeah. position is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't respond to the point. Yeah. And, and any well, I applied it to the Carter administration okay. as well. So Fine. it has nothing to do okay. with partisan Your broad politics. sides are appreciated. Yeah. The point was you yeah. made a direct core relation that yeah. this person, because he was glib, would be a great president. No, no, I'm, I was I, just curious for about what, For one person, Obviously. I'm not a great fan of glibness. What I'm saying is, that it, as, as a matter of fact, Lester Pearson uh, was far from glib and probably the most effective uh, Canadian prime minister uh, in this century. He was far from glib, but he came through up, up through this socialization. And uh, he knew how to handle himself in the House in a way which gave the public confidence even though he wasn't a great orator. But they knew, he, he, facing the trial by fire on a day-to-day -day basis, the public found a comfort zone with that individual. But the individual was not living uh, in isolation in the White House. The individual then would have to, after leaving the floor of the House, had to go through a thing called the scrum. Fine, fine. And gotcha. then, Thank you. you know, Neither the volume uh, nor, nor the decibels of the argument improves it significantly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for coming, and we appreciate all the wonderful testimony you provide us with. Thank you. The next three witnesses uh, will be the 
will be Norman Einstein, resident scholar of the American Enterprise Institute, Thomas Mann, director of the governmental studies at Brookings Institution, uh, Professor Hugh Helco, uh, Clarence J. Robinson, professor of government and politics at George Mason University. Gentlemen, uh, you can go either way you want. I don't know. Take your take Okay. Yeah. We'll take okay. Uh, Mr. Mann for us then. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here with you. Uh, uh, the last uh, series of uh, witnesses uh, drive home the point that uh, there is not a party line on institutional reform questions at the Brookings Institution. Mr. Cutler is a trustee of Brookings. Mr. Sunquist is a longtime senior fellow. Uh, I'm at Brookings. Uh, they think this is a good idea. I think on balance it's, uh, it's not a very good idea. I say that finding myself usually in agreement with Mr. Gadenson on matters pertaining to campaign finance and voter registration reform and a host of other things, but I think on this matter I, I'd like to associate myself with what I thought were the eloquent comments of Mr. Bielenson. Um, this wouldn't do much good, probably not much harm, but the bottom line is it's not related in any significant way to the problems that Congress confronts and that we confront uh, as a country. Sure, it would be nice to improve the dialogue between the executive and legislative branches. I'd love to stimulate public interest and in truly important national issues of uh, the day. But I'm not persuaded a congressional uh, question period would accomplish those objectives. I really have three problems with it. First, I think the president has no incentive to permit members of his cabinet to accept invitations to congressional question period. Secondly, even if he did, uh, a host of practical problems threaten to overwhelm its uh, potentially positive features. And third, there really are other methods available uh, for focusing the energies of uh, government on pressing problems and for engaging the public in, in a meaningful uh, uh, debate. Imagine what would happen if, if you passed this. Uh, uh, Secretaries uh, Brady, Baker, Cheney will be invited at the outset to the well of the House. Uh, the President uh, will instruct them not to accept the invitation, at which point uh, you all will issue a broadside that uh, the President and his cabinet, his administration are avoiding the truly important problems confronting the country. Uh, another episode in the ongoing partisan warfare between the country. The, the fact is question period reflects the weakness of Parliament, not its strength. Uh, the president, the prime minister, and his cabinet are creatures of the parliament. They have to make themselves available. But this is neither an opportunity for parliamentary uh, influence or control, nor an occasion for a productive dialogue uh, between the branches. I think careful observers uh, agree that it, it usually or oftentimes deteriorates into bitter exchanges, fiercely competitive, highly charged, and acrimonious. This is a time for point-seeking and uh, in political uh, gamesmanship. It's true in the Canadian House of Parliament Commons as well as the, the British House. It's, it's basically an opportunity to uh, embarrass the government. Wonderful theater at times, but very little of consequence uh, flowing from it. I mean, given that presidents know what the experience is in parliamentary systems, why in the world would they subject them selves uh, to this. Why would an executive in a separation of power system submit to this highly visible questioning by the legislature, especially when that legislature is likely to be controlled by the, by the other party? Uh, I think presidents face highly independent, powerful Congresses with substantial weapons, real weapons, budgetary, lawmaking, uh, subpoena powers, confirmation powers. Why subject himself to, uh, to the possibility of indignity uh, uh, throwing his members uh, of the cabinet to the lions? It seems to me under the best of circumstances, this is a bad fit, a question period with the separation of power systems. But under divided government, and we've all agreed divided government is a real problem today, uh, it seems to me it would reinforce the system's worst features. That means partisan bickering and posturing. Blame avoidance, right? It's the other guy who did it. Stalemate. 
And most importantly, the triumph of appearances over outcomes. Uh, our government is consumed with looking right, uh, and we have too little attention to outcomes. And it seems to me this would neither promote an interbranch cooperation and trust that you need if you want to govern under divided government, nor would it clarify for the public, and this is a point uh, Mr. Cutler and Mr. Sunquist were dealing with, it would not clarify for the public the cost uh, of divided bar, uh, government, nor would it, would it make clear the benefits of unified party control. I don't think any such public education would, uh, would result. So, uh, second reason, it's not going to provide backbench members with any real opportunity to question cabinet members. You, you've got one question period, two hour a month. That means each cabinet member will get up here roughly once a year. Um, there are two hours. Each question could take seven and a half minutes with a follow-up. A little arithmetic reveals there's time for as few as eight questions from each side of the aisle. That doesn't give members an, uh, an opportunity. They have much greater opportunity now to question uh, cabinet members through the uh, committee system. Nor does it offer much promise of a meaningful debate on national health insurance or competitiveness, inner city poverty. Think about it. You've got a series of of 16 discrete questions. Uh, this is not the occasion to produce a meaningful debate. The reality is question periods are highly stylized. They're staged. Um, and they are much more likely to produce a contentious partisan and disjointed uh, performance than Mr. Gadenson would hope uh, and, and genuinely relish. Three suggestions for alternatives to this. Uh, uh, the first is let the, let the Congress go forward on its own to replace special orders with a congressional uh, debate time. Why not set up a debate between the majority and minority party uh, as often as you would like and focus it on a single issue and bring your best debaters forward? The country will pay some attention to it. Second, uh, it, by the way, this would directly counter the charge that House Democrats are merely trying to embarrass a Republican president. Uh, second. It, it seems to me, look at your own present organization procedures to see how you can better deal with new problems and how you can avoid the problems of exacerbating tensions between the branches. Uh, you might look at, for example, joint hearings uh, at which cabinet members appear so that instead of being nickeled and dimed to death and subcommittee after subcommittee, they make major appearances before a substantial number of, uh, of members uh, and committees. I frankly think that the resolution introduced by uh, Mr. Hamilton um, and Mr. Grattison uh, offers the most promising vehicle for a whole-scale examination of the problems of internal organization. The final point that I end on, the majority party has a special responsibility in this system. It's particularly true under divided government to come up with, to identify its legislative program, and then to see to it that that program emerges from the committee system and is put forward on the floor. Uh, that's, the, that's the object. Be serious about what you want to accomplish and take what measures you need within the Democratic caucus to get it out of committee on the floor. Um, be concerned with real outcomes and not so much with debating points with the president. The time has come to sort of de-emphasize appearance and debate and put a little more emphasis on genuine accomplishments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Norman Einstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a uh, pleasure to be here uh, to talk about checks and balances. Uh, like many of the rest of you, I've spent most of the last week talking about checks and imbalances, and uh, I'm glad that we can get back. To, I'm glad that we can get back to uh, something more substantive. Uh, some of the shows that uh, Mr. Bielinson had discussed earlier, I'm afraid. Uh, I uh, do not have uh, uh, deep emotional feelings about this proposal, frankly, one way or the other. I do not think it would be a terrible disaster. I do not think it would uh, move the country dramatically in a positive direction. I do commend Sam Gadenson for raising 
what I think is the broader issue here, which is how can we engage more in constructive engagement over ideas and important policies that affect the country? How can we get back on that track and away from the downward course, which uh, uh, Tony Bielenson talked about so movingly uh, earlier? That means between the parties, uh, it means uh, between the uh, branches of government as well. And uh, I want to follow a little bit up on what uh, Tom Mann had said, uh, some ideas that we have kicked around for, uh, for a while in, in dealing with some of these problems. Frankly, I do think there is some difficulty in terms of the relationship between cabinet officers and other high executive branch officials and the Congress. The biggest problem is the fragmentation and the enormous amount of time which is spent now by people coming up here to testify. We've moved beyond the uh, obvious key committees and subcommittees. Uh, of which there are always more than two in any event uh, in, in either body up here, uh, the uh, uh, authorizing and appropriating subcommittees, now to having dozens of others, many of whom want cabinet officers to come in, not so much because there's really an important set of issues to be discussed, but for the ego gratification of having an important executive branch official come up. That's and right. I think that occurs uh, whichever party is in the White House. Uh, and we ought to think seriously about ways in which we can responsibly do something about it to create a better balance. And frankly, I don't think it's a bad trade-off to say uh, to the executive branch, we'll come up with a more responsible way here. Some of it in, may, may well involve, as Tom suggested, uh, pooling of members into joint hearings. Some of it, and I think what ought to be seriously considered here, is having a certain core group of hearings to which we expect cabinet officers to appear, and then having a process whereby the joint leadership really makes decisions uh, when committees and subcommittees ask to have key executive branch officials come up so that you can limit some of that time. If in return for that, you get a commitment to have cabinet officers come up and engage more broadly in a discussion with the House of Representatives, I think that would be something a president ought to seriously consider because then you've got an executive branch getting something in return. More broadly, though, I think we've got to think through ways in which we can get the House back to doing what it sometimes does in its finest hours, which is engage in real debate across the widest range of opinion with some of the finest people that we have in the country those who serve here in this Congress on important issues. We did have it on the Gulf War. We've had it before on issues from immigration to welfare to a, to a range of others. But rarely does it happen in a way that engages the country. And I think, frankly, now that we are in a time when television is a fact of life, and I'll move away from uh, what happens on talk shows or uh, uh, other occasions, which try to shed more heat uh, than light, uh, which are oriented towards uh, taking cheap shots, but rather the opportunity that exists with C-SPAN for Congress to present itself to the American people, and frankly, Congress manages itself abysmally in this process. You ought to think seriously through how that can be managed better, not by manipulation, but by creating opportunities where large numbers of Americans can really see constructive debate going on. And what I would urge you to do is to revise the special order process, but even think more broadly about engaging in a regular process of prime time debates, change the rules or have a separate set of rules that would govern these particular processes with a focus, a substantive focus, an important issue, and even under those circumstances, invite members of the cabinet or others to participate in that debate. I'll give you an example of what I think would be very useful right now. There is one area of public policy where I believe we're having a serious debate going on, but it's going on uh, at subterranean levels. And that's over what national security posture we take to the world and what we do with defense. I commend Les Aspen, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, who I think has been extraordinarily constructive in getting out there and engaging in that debate. And he's engaged in a debate with Colin Powell, with uh, uh, Secretary Cheney and with uh, others uh, here within the Congress and outside in the Defense Department over how we approach now in the post-Cold War era where we're actually going to go with our defenses, what kinds of defense commitments we need, what kind of money is going to be required under those circumstances, what threats we face, and where we uh, begin to uh, focus on the kinds of threats that are appropriate for us to face. I would love to see a two or three hour debate, or maybe even a couple of them, in prime time with all the people and some of the best people in this institution who have thought about these issues on the floor talking about what role America plays in the post-Cold War period and what that means in terms of the defense commitments that we have. 
Frankly, it would be nice if it were happening in a more constructive and detailed way in the presidential campaign, but I would leave that one aside. That's an appropriate role for the House of Representatives. And if you had that kind of a debate and invited Cheney and Powell and others to participate in it in a free and open way, and particularly if you could combine that with some way of reducing the other commitments for the cabinet members, I think it would serve the nation and it would serve this institution. And it might get people out in the country uh, from Jay Leno right on down through others, uh, thinking back or at least focusing a little bit more on what we ought to be doing here and, uh, and less on some of the sideshows that tend to get all the attention right now. Thank you. Thank you. Know. Professor Hecklow. Thank you. Uh, I've tried to keep an open mind on this subject, and I am bracketed by two you've, of the... You've got a lot of company. <laughs> bracketed by two of the smartest people on Congress. And I'm pleased to say that without talking with either of these gentlemen independently, I've come to the same conclusion. Uh, that must be some operational definition of uh, truth or something. I am all that stands between you and lunch. So uh, <laughs> let me make a few very summary comments. First of all, Tom's right. Question period is an accommodation to legislative weakness. It is a gesture to the fact that the executive dominates the agenda and the substantive work of parliament. It is extraordinary to see a legislature like ours considering such a proposal, which is a reflection of the fact that the executive dominates the legislature. It's like finding Arnold Schwarzenegger trying to borrow shoulder pads from Pee Wee Herman. You are the Schwarzenegger of world legislators. You have all the power you need to question executive officials short of the president. Second of all, question period is political partisan warfare between a government and an opposition, both of whom represent coherent parties within the legislature. To have a question period in our separated power system is to ask for an intensification of partisanship when what we need is more comity between the branches. We don't need more drama. We need more competence and more goodwill. I've made these points in my testimony, which is submitted for the record. Third, question period as it operates within a parliamentary system scrutinizes the full range of executive responsibility. By that I mean the prime minister appears. It would be creating a semi-sovereign power to exclude this prime minister from question period. But we are not going to include the president in question period. So what we're going to see, if we have it in our system, is a shadow boxing with surrogates admitted to the chamber of the floor when it suits the administration's purposes, capable of performing all sorts of mischief within the deliberations of Congress. Let me make my six summary points and not test your patience any further. The reasons for these conclusions are in the testimony. First, a House question period would likely confuse, not clarify, political responsibility. Second, it would increase, not decrease, an already, already debilitating partisanship between the branches. Third, it would be very unlikely to increase the amount of information coming from the executive branch to Congress. And in fact, by drawing attention away from committee work, it would probably decrease the amount of reliable non-showcased information. Fourth, it would create new and unwelcome opportunities for all sorts of executive mischief within the organization and deliberations of Congress. The White House has reacted to this proposal by saying that it would throw Daniel into the lion's den with every opportunity for being eaten. Actually, it would put the fox in the hen house. I, in my testimony, have tried to indicate to you from the historical record how the Founding Fathers realized that danger. Contrary to what's been published, including in the Congressional record and in the C-SPAN update, there is no reliable precedent for this in the first Congress. George Washington did not regularly appear before the House or the Senate. In my testimony, I've given you what I regard as the fullest description of Mr. Washington's, President Washington's appearance. He appeared with Secretary of War Henry Knox. There is only one other occasion when a cabinet secretary appeared before that first Congress. That was John Jay. Every time Congress was presented with this opportunity, Congress said no to it. For example, 
in the legislation creating the Department of the Treasury, which I recount in my too long testimony, it was proposed to the House that the Treasury Secretary be required to digest and report plans for improvement and management of the revenue. In the House, a debate immediately erupted. Congressman Page. This would establish a precedent which might be extended until we admitted all the ministers of the government on the floor to explain and support the plans they have digested and reported, thus laying a foundation for an aristocracy or a detestable monarch. So what did the House do? They eventually compromised. And instead of saying report, they required the Secretary of the Treasury to prepare plans. In the second Congress of the United States, a motion was made John, James Madison was the leader of the House. A motion was made to bring two secretaries to discuss the defeat. General St. Clair at the hand of the Indians, it was decisively defeated, precisely for the fear that inducing unelected representatives into the debates on the floor of the House of Commons could upset the basic idea of this constitutional design. I say all this to make a point. My final conclusion is that a question period would compromise the integrity of the House floor as a forum for debate among the people's representatives. What I'm going to say, I think, is going to sound corny to any of you that have watched a congressional debate, including debates televised on C-SPAN. But I'll say it anyway. The floors of the House and the Senate these great and often underpopulated rooms are the institutional shrine of our form of government. They are the embodiment of the master idea behind this design. And that idea is government by discussion. Over the years, Congress has evolved all sorts of subordinate organs to allow executive officials to take part in the lawmaking process. But ultimately, before the Senate, before the House of Representatives as a whole, government by discussion can be legitimately carried out only by the elected representatives of the people. The floor of the Congress is no place for unelected presidential appointees to be sharing in the debate among the people's representatives. So, I come to a conclusion of sorts that this isn't a good idea. And indeed, as my colleagues say, there is much more important work to be done here. The words I heard, we are smothering our form of government. Our institution is committing suicide. I heard those words not from some campus radicals that I might have listened to in the 60s. These are the words of elected leaders of this institution now. Something is seriously wrong. All right, and here we are. We've defeated all our foreign enemies. And I, I think it was Lincoln who said, I can't quote him right, he said, if this experiment in self-government fails, it's not going to be beaten by foreign enemies. They won't be able to drink out of the Shenandoah or step one foot on the great Northwest Territory. We'll do it to ourselves. We'll do it to ourselves. We don't have to, I don't think. Norm and Tom and others like Congressman Hamilton are trying to struggle with these ideas, how we could make this system, government by discussion, work a lot better. So I'm not pessimistic about that. But televised question period on the floor of the House for unelected presidential appointees? No, that's not what we need. Without objection, uh, Professor, your entire statement will appear, appear on the record. I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, hearing you all uh, speak to the subject. I, I just can't imagine you didn't just come from some caucus in which you all presided <laughs> one way or the other. Uh, we all did come to Washington at the same time, however. Right? All right. <laughs> 60, oh, <God>. 69. <laughs> Tony? I turned it off. Somebody runs in. can't. There I am. This was, as I don't need to say, Mr. Chairman, this was another 
truly excellent panel, and I'd like, if I may, to congratulate our chairman for, for having invited such a splendid, superb group of, of people to, to testify today. Again, I don't have much to, to offer. I mean, it, the hour is late, and these gentlemen all made their points pretty, you know, quite obviously and quite well. Uh, let, let me just let me just speak about one point, which which Professor Hecklow came back to. Mr. Sunquist had mentioned earlier. Um, Tom Mann mentioned in his prepared testimony a little bit more at greater length than he did in, in his oral testimony. But let me just read you something from a um, couple of pieces of testimony, prepared testimony here from Mr. Sunquist to begin with. Although he, I guess he came down sort of generally semi-favorably about the, about the prospects or the idea of a question period. He said, I would enter, and this is the first page of his prepared testimony, I would enter a strong reservation as to the pertinence of the parliamentary experience to our concerns. Those are countries where the cabinet members not only sit in the parliament, but serve as its leaders, where backbenchers have a very limited role and little influence, and where legislative committees have not developed as oversight bodies. Thus, the question period is revolved as a kind of oversight device in which legislators who are not in the executive branch have an opportunity to participate, and it thus serves as a substitute and a relatively unsatisfactory one, I believe, for the far more extensive and intensive oversight that's carried out by the elaborate structure of committees and subcommittees in the U.S. House and the Senate. Mr. Mann said, um, and Professor Hecklow made this point very, very strongly and alluded again, to, I think, to Tom Mann's testimony. Question time, and, and I quote him, question time in parliamentary systems reflects the relative weakness of the parliament and the absence of powerful tools for overseeing and controlling the government. Uh, I just think we have to emphasize that point because, in fact, and this is the point I was trying to make in a kind of different way earlier on, that if we tended to our own responsibilities as they're currently set forth, not only in the Constitution, but in our own procedures, and did a better job in the kinds of things we're, we're supposed to be doing, uh, that would provide some very real results uh, and instead of perhaps fooling around with, with this. Let me just cite one in instance, and then I'll be quiet, Mr. Chairman, that I, that I mentioned on the floor of the House, I think, a, a year and a half or so ago when I was presenting the Intelligence Authorization Bill to give you some idea of the difference uh, in, the, in the strength uh, of, uh, of our own of our own uh, legislative body here, which the professor especially alluded to, compared to the parliamentary bodies. Um, on a couple of occasions, a year and a half or so ago, when I served as chairman of, of, of that intelligence, uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, we were, we were visited by both British and Canadian members of parliament who were members of their own intelligence oversight committees. And all of them were astonished to find out that we, in fact, as members of the committee, all the members of the committee, Republicans and Democrats alike, not just the chairman, uh, were, were told the secrets by the uh, CIA and the NSA and the president's people. They said, you mean they, they tell you the, the secrets? Uh, the, tr the truth of the matter is that the chairman and the members of the over intelligence and security oversight committees of these two parliamentary bodies uh, do not share in what's going on with their intelligence agencies. The minister in charge does, but any time the committee, or even the chairman of the committee, deigns to raise a question, you know, pose a question, are we really involved with Iraq, are we fooling around in Panama, whatever it might be, uh, the minister cuts them off. And the, I mean, these chaps are, are not involved. We're all in the loop here. We all have responsibilities. We all have power as members of our, of our oversight committees, whether they be authorizing or appropriating committees. We have a very real role to play, which not only backbenchers, but the vast majority of members of the Canadian and British parliaments don't. The ministers do. They, you know, they run their, their ministries. The rest of them just sit around, and once a, once a day for an hour, they yell at each other, ask each other impertinent questions, apparently. It's a good outlet for them. Uh, but we have, real, we have real work to do. And uh, you know, when the time comes, if we fix, if we've done our, if we start doing our own job really well and do our own work really well, and and decide that uh, we need an extra hour or so a month or two hours a month to ask the cabinet people some questions that would help our work, well, then, then we can talk about it. But you know, we've got some homework to do first. It seems to me ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Williamson. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, so we can uh, be brief, and I know you're hungry as we are. Uh, I'm sure none of you would mind uh, if we submitted questions to you for the, uh, for the permanent record, uh, and we'll do so with unanimous consent. Without objection. And uh, uh, Mr. Hecklow, you said that uh, we've defeated all of our enemies uh, except us, <laughs> and sometimes we, we seem to be our own worst enemy. And uh, I talk about that because, Mr. Ornstein, you brought out the point that um, we waste so much time and you talked about if this was an effect that we would uh, 
that cabinet members who already spend an inordinate amount of time appearing before not only major committees on major issues, but uh, uh, before minor committees on uh, practically non-existent issues just to feed the ego of members of Congress, and you just are so absolutely right. As a matter of fact, um, and I know all of you observe the workings of the Congress in, uh, in this uh, session, and uh, most of the major legislation that has come out of this Congress in this uh, 102nd Congress has bypassed the committees of jurisdiction. When you look at the banking reform, when you look at the crime bill, uh, the defense bill, all of these things, in other words, we are so bogged down with this, this uh, system that we have to operate under, it just does not work. And so often, uh, uh, subcommittee chairmen can block major legislation because of all this sequential referral where uh, drug bills are referred to five different committees. They never see the light of day unless uh, you want to bypass the system and write, rewrite the legislation in some back room somewhere, which is what uh, we do all too often. But uh, I was just, I won't repeat uh, my experiences in the NATO assembly uh, uh, with what members of the British and Canadian Parliament think about this question and answer period. But uh, Tom Mann said it, uh, it would further denigrate this Congress in the eyes of the American people. And, uh, and we are already denigrated to a point. It's uh, yeah, because they don't see us as a, as a functioning body. And I think that the recommendations made by, I believe, all three of you that uh, we might uh, uh, replace the, uh, this wasted special order session out there. We have two tremendously wasteful sessions in the Congress. One is the one-minute sessions that we have where we, we do our own little uh, question and answer thing where one Democrat stands up and he will blabbast the President and then some Republican will get up and he'll bash and he goes back and forth for a, an hour, sometimes two hours, before we get around to the, to the real functioning of what we were there to do. And that's a total waste of time. Special orders. When C-SPAN plays and the American people watch uh, after the, the, we've done with our business and they see some uh, congressman uh, up there orating uh, to an empty house about nothing, uh, <laughs> that's a terrible waste of time. Except for mine. Except for yours, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if we could uh, devote this time to, uh, to meaningful uh, dialogue and debate uh, on certain times, I think that's a great suggestion. That's what I'm hopeful will come out of the Hamilton Gratison and, uh, and my legislation, where we could rewrite the rules of this House so that the committees could function. Select committees. We have a select committee on narcotics abuse. Select committees are, f are formed to uh, deal with one question. And when that question is over, then they disband that select committee. I've been here 14 years. I don't know of one select committee that's ever been disbanded. Not only has it not been disbanded, but it continues to grow and grow and grow. And the number of employees continue to grow and grow and grow. And that's what's wrong with our system. That's why we desperately need a task force to look into our committee system and not headed by members of Congress because of our, our protection of our fiefdoms. Because we aren't going to do the job. We need to do it with outsiders and insiders in the Congress if we're going to be successful. So I've got a lot of questions, but I'll submit them to you and hope that you will give us your answers. And if I could just make one uh, comment, uh, Mr. Solomon. Uh, at the moment, uh, Tom Mann and I are beginning the process of uh, heading up an effort with, uh, we hope, uh, outside funding by foundations to do an independent uh, and nonpartisan look at this institution uh, that we hope will be of use to uh, whatever product emerges uh, from the Hamilton Gratison effort or any others uh, down the road uh, that we hope to pursue through the next year to 18 months. Let me tell you, that could be the greatest contribution to this body. Uh, when I first came here in 1979, I was put on a, a committee on committees to, to study the committee system. And uh, we had, uh, I think it was a Democrat from California, a young Patterson. Jerry Patterson. Jerry Patterson, yes. And we served diligently, and we worked, and we put together, and we came out, and we, we showed all of these wasteful subcommittees, and we brought this bill to the floor of Congress. And do you know what happened? Out of 435 members, we got 44 votes to reform the House, because every subcommittee and every ranking Republican voted against it. And only us few, and that only leaves about 45 of us back then when I was a freshman, have no fiefdom, so we voted for it. 
that would be a great contribution. I would like to work with you, and so would this committee. Tony Bielenson heads up the subcommittee on rules, and uh, uh, David, you're the uh, the ranking Republican. We'd love to uh, work with you. Job if you don't work with <laughs> anyway, thanks for your uh, contribution. I appreciate it. Mr. Trier. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, just say that the, uh, the work that all of you have done on uh, trying to bring about some kind of reform in this House, I believe, is very positive. You over the weekend, Norm, on a couple of the programs indicated that tremendous reform has taken place. And on one of them, you talked about the fact that there is uh, really uh, much less of a problem today than there has been in the past. Uh, especially in the area of corruption, I guess, I think is what you were trying to get at when we were talking about this check-bouncing scandal. But it does seem to me that as we look at uh, the kinds of reforms which we on this side of the aisle think are necessary to try and bring about some kind of balance to the uh, process of representative government, the work that you're doing can play an integral role in making that happen if we can get people in the majority to, in fact, listen to it. Now, I'm not going to presuppose what it is that you are going to have as, as far as recommendations, but I suspect that any kind of change will, in fact, be opposed by some people in this House. Uh, you know, it, it really did take us a while to bring about the changes that we have seen take place. I mean, it took a scandal to close down a very poorly managed dispersing office downstairs. And uh, I hope very much that we don't have to have scandal after scandal for us to bring about the kinds of proposals for reform, which I hope that, that you and Tom will have in your, in your uh, study. Mr. Dry, I'd just say, if, if there weren't any opposition to whatever we recommend, it would be conclusive proof that we weren't recommending anything important uh, or useful. Uh, this is a case where a, a minimum winning coalition as opposed to 44 votes on the floor is, uh, is probably what uh, is most desirable. I hope that you'll have, I hope, Tom, that you'll have a majority and I hope that we'll be able to, to see that come together and maybe this, the fact that we're finally seeing uh, this anti-incumbent sentiment materialize over the past, uh, you know, yesterday and as we approach November, I think that that might play a role in leading some in this House to bring about a, a greater degree of reform. I, I just say it, it seems to me that the most important point here is, is, is to constructively channel the energies and anxiety and animus uh, toward this institution. That is to figure out a way to get out ahead of, uh, of this sentiment that exists outside that sometimes is articulated in a very mindless and destructive way. The mm -hmm. trick is to get in front of it and channel it in ways that will strengthen this institution. Hugh Hecklow is absolutely right. This is an absolutely critical institution, essential to our functioning as a democracy. It is being diminished and demeaned, and, and we and you have to figure out uh, a way to restore its place. It should be strong. It should it should go with its comparative strengths and advantages. Uh, and uh, that's something I hope we can all contribute. Let to. me say that I think that it's it's uh, an interesting commentary, and I'm happy that the three of you are here as panelists. But it's an interesting commentary that it took a proposal to establish a question period for cabinet members to get you all to come before us and actually talk about reform. Again, uh, it, was, it was really uh, insistence on the part of Sam and, and some others to pursue this issue uh, that led us to get to the, to the uh, issue of, of trying to bring about some kind of reform in this House. So, I mean, that in itself is an interesting commentary as to what it is that brought us here. I mean, uh, uh, what I think is uh, kind of an intriguing proposal but uh, one which uh, I surmise from what Bob told me, I'm sorry I missed your testimony, that you all are not terribly supportive of moving towards the high theater that would be created with a question period, uh, that it took that issue to bring you all here to bring about reform, and that in itself demonstrates the fact that we have uh, the determination of the legislative agenda uh, put forth by, uh, uh, without much input from our side of the aisle. Let me just say uh, uh, as well that I, I think it's terrific that, uh, that uh, the committee has held this hearing. Congress has done a lot over the years, and we didn't uh, start our effort in response to, to a scandal. We started it because every institution needs self-renewal. This has done a lot uh, over the years. In fact, Congress has almost always been a leader in self-renewal among institutions. I, I personally believe at this point, in this post-Cold War era, 
that the executive branch ought to be taking a careful look at itself. I, I'd support a, a Hoover-type commission that would look at all of the institutions. Not saying that things are wrong or that simply shifting the institutional structures around is going to bring about some nirvana. It's a good time to do it, and it's a time especially now when we've got to start channeling our energies, as Tom said, in a constructive direction. And I think we can do this in a bipartisan fashion. Norman, the point that I was trying to make is that it took scandal to actually make the change. All kinds of reform proposals can come forward, and I think a Hoover Commission concept is great. But to actually make the change of what took place downstairs, it took that scandal to have it happen. If we had not had the scandal of these checks down there, do you think that we wouldn't have a sergeant-at-arms bank today? Of course it would still be in existence. So. Tragically, it took that kind of action to actually make the kinds of changes which many of us have proposed over the years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to thank all of you for your testimony and for caring. And uh, I'm going to, I saved my questions earlier so that I can pontificate here for about 90 seconds. And just to say what I started to say earlier, and that is that this nation uh, had no blueprint, nobody to follow. It was a novel approach. It wasn't founded, when I say this nation, this country. This wasn't a nation, nation or people. This country was found, was the only country founded not around a nation, but around an idea. And for 100 years, nobody followed it. Uh, it came to prominence about the turn of the century, and in the interwar period, it was one of five great nations. The end of World War II, one of two great philosophies, freedom and democracy headed by the United States, communism, freedom headed by the Soviet Union. That's where we've been for 45 years, until now. And at this moment, as we sit here, Never in the history of this country or in the history of man has there been such a total collapse of the intellectual debate as to the superiority of one political idea over any other political idea. The women standing in line for bread in Moscow and the cab drivers in Warsaw or Prague or the campesinos in Central America will all say that free elections and free markets are superior. So here we are. Economically, America running far and away. Just a quick little figure about the, the fact that not only is America, uh, Japan would be our nearest competitors and we outproduce them far and away, but exports, American products sold abroad. We are by far the greatest exporter. If anyone were to catch us, their exports would have to grow more rapidly than ours. In the last six years, American exports have increased 100%, doubled, 96% increase. Number two in that relationship is France. They're at 30% below France, Italy, Italy then Germany, Germany then Britain, Britain then Canada, Canada then, then Japan. So the United States is not only number one, but, but far and away and growing number one. Militarily, there is no topic of discussion, militarily. We have never been so unchallenged militarily in the world as we are at this moment. The Soviet Union has between 800 and 1,000 and a million men foraging in the forest for wild animals and fish in order to survive. They have 600,000 living in tents. So that's economically, militarily, geopolitically. Our ideas and values are sweeping the globe. Now what brought that? It was a representative form of democracy, not by bloodline or by intellect or by religion, or by, but because of the sifting process of democracy that we chose our leadership through a system where we have this constant ventilation of our, any difficulties that we have called the Congress of the United States. Now here we are at the pinnacle of power, that for which our forefathers dreamed and prayed. And at this moment when the whole world is looking to us for leadership and help and advice, we are in the process of saying, oh, how rotten and awful everything is. And you, Norman, are, in my opinion, the single greatest defender and spokesman for our way of life in the last month of anybody in this country while everyone else has been diving under the chairs and, and under, the, under the tables and refusing and to be caught, and all of us are like that, because 99.9% uh, .9 of anything that went on downstairs, quote unquote, uh, was insignificant in my mind. But the second you step out to try to s explain it, then they can always bring out one or two, and then they say, now see, he's trying to defend that, and so everybody goes back in their hole. And so what? The average person, the average teenager, the average young person, the average college student, the average worker just says, yeah, that's right. This system of ours really is pretty rotten, isn't it? Because I hear it all day, every day. I pick up the newspaper. I listen to politicians. They're saying they're all corrupt. They say, they say politicians, the people we look up to, they're saying they're all corrupt. And the newspapers and radio stations says they're all corrupt. And you, Norman, have been willing to try to put this in perspective. And the whole point of all this is just to say thank you on, on behalf of someone who appreciates this country, who believes that this system of government is by far and away the best that anyone ever had, had dinner 
recently for, for with Eastern Europeans hosted by the chairman of the stock exchange here in the United States and all these are setting up stock exchanges they've been all over the world and they all just spent the whole dinner talking about the fact only America only America so we went to Germany and Germany if you want to get a loan the bank demands equity position and so therefore you can't own your company and you go to go to Japan Japan tells whether or not you fit in in the hierarchy said in America an inner city worker can walk out on the street corner and buy shares of GM. Oh, that's where equality, that's what we want. So the whole world is coming to us, and I appreciate your defending us somewhat, and for that I say thank you. <laughs> well, actually, that's one speech that I agree with, that, he's, 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 that Mr. McHugh has made. Uh, I thank you very much. I know you very talented uh, gentlemen have many requests for your time, and I thank you very much for coming before the committee and help us uh, get into the problem and which way we can solve it. Get, Thank get, you. Get busy with your task force. <laughs> Thank you. The uh, committee will stand in re uh, recess subject to call the chair. Good evening from Washington, D.C. You're watching C-SPAN 2. Our non-